Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second day of our symposium. We hope you were able to join us yesterday, and we thank you for joining us again today. I'm uh, Dan Rader. I'm chair of the Department of Genetics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and very pleased to be co-hosting this symposium with the Center for Global Genomics and Health Equity. So we had a, a, a terrific first day of this symposium for those of you who are able to join. <clears throat> um, terrific uh, speakers, terrific discussion, and we're really looking forward to uh, a second day. And our, our second day is focused on uh, the importance and challenges of increasing ethnic diversity um, in human genomics research. And this is the agenda for today. I'll come back to this at the end of my brief introduction. But again, we have a terrific lineup today of speakers and look forward to discussion. I wanted to make a, a few comments about um, what we refer to as Penn Genetics, the genetics ecosystem uh, within the University of Pennsylvania and our close partner, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We have a department of genetics that has a range of investigators who work uh, from in various model systems all the way through uh, human genetics and computational genomics. And then we have a number of uh, partners, both on the clinical side, divisions of human genetics in both adults and children, and the Orphan Disease Center, the Penn Center for Precision Medicine, and then especially the Epigenetics Institute, uh, directed by Dr. Shelley Berger, a close partner in, uh, in uh, a lot of the work we do within uh, genetics at Penn, and also the Institute for Biomedical Informatics directed by Dr. Jason Moore, again, a key partner for a lot of our efforts. So I do want to emphasize that we have a, a, a very um, diverse, in many ways, scientific uh, community uh, at, at Penn in genetics and genomics, um, with work that spans um, cells and model systems all the way through humans, and one that we continue to look to uh, increase in terms of uh, adding faculty and trainees uh, to this uh, uh, large ecosystem. You learned about the Center for Global Genomics and Health Equity uh, yesterday. This is a new center that Dr. Tishkoff uh, founded last year. We're very excited about the potential of this center. And of course, this symposium is designed to highlight some of the major issues that this center is tackling. I'd also like to, again, remind you of uh, Dr. Dorothy Hammond, the uh, assistant director of the center, and uh, Ms. Amina Alamin, uh, the executive assistant, who are critical to the mission of this center and who also have been really critical in uh, pulling off and arranging this symposium. I wanted to mention our Penn Medicine Biobank, uh, one area that uh, really um, speaks to our interest in uh, diversity in human genomics. It's a, an entity that is a single IRB approved protocol that is over the entire of the Penn medical health system uh, of six hospitals and uh, five million plus patients. It recruits from a variety of sites in the course of routine care and is largely disease agnostic. Uh, we've recruited uh, about 70,000 individuals to date, of whom about a quarter are of African ancestry. So one of the largest, diverse, most diverse academically based biobanks in the US. We've been able to generate about 45,000 whole exome sequences and uh, array-based genotype data in these individuals and will be uh, sequencing everyone. Uh, we have extensive uh, curated clinical data from the EHR and permission to recontact and call back. So I wanted to highlight this as one resource at Penn that we have that is really contributing to many different investigators throughout Penn and their interests in uh, human genomics and particularly the issue of diversity as it applies to research in human genomics. We're also very committed to building diversity in the biomedical workforce at Penn. I briefly alluded to this uh, yesterday at the end of the uh, session. In terms of faculty recruitment, we are in the process of initiating uh, cluster hires and also will be submitting an NIH application to the NIH FIRST Award, which uh, you heard about yesterday from Dr. Gibbons, um, uh, something that uh, we're, we're very excited about and committed to. We've also increased our efforts to recruit postdoctoral fellows from a, a diverse uh, a pool. 
Um, our biomedical graduate studies program has uh, very substantially increased its recruitment efforts uh, with regard to uh, diverse applicants. And we're actively expanding opportunities for undergraduate and high school students, uh, in, specifically in research in genetics and genomics. I also want to mention that at Penn, we have one of the largest programs for a master's in genetic counseling in the country. And one of the key objectives of this program, directed by Kathy Belverde, is to increase diversity within the program and within genetic counseling as a whole. So uh, in, in these efforts of building diversity at Penn in the biomedical workforce, a major focus is in the area of genetics and computational genomics. And again, I, I'll mention, as I did yesterday, that if there are any, any individuals who are participating in this symposium who are on the job market or uh, looking for uh, new opportunities, we'd love to hear from you. Again, I want to thank the key individuals, the four individuals who did all the work to make this symposium possible, Dr. Hammond, uh, Amina Alamine, uh, Augustine uh, Benjamin, and Kimberly Runyon. Uh, we could not have done this symposium without you. Thank you so much. Uh, really critical to making this happen. So today uh, we are going to have a, a very exciting uh, a program with uh, speakers um, who will be presenting on a, a range of topics. And um, the focus will be challenges with conducting genomic studies in minority populations. Uh, Dr. Tishkoff will be introducing our keynote speaker, and then um, uh, Dr. Steve uh, Jaffe will be uh, moderating the rest of the session for today. We thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we remind you that there um, will be Q&A that you can put in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Once again, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the session. Dr. Tishkoff, I'll turn things over to you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Dan. I'm actually going to uh, share a few slides first before I do my introduction of Dr. Wankum. So let me just try to open those. First of all, I just want to say again, welcome to everybody. We are so excited that over almost 1,000 people have signed up for the symposium. And this map is showing the uh, global, the location of where people are across the world. I am so thrilled to see this broad representation, um, in particular from Africa. I think it's fantastic that we're able, uh, during these times that everything's virtual, we're able to have this really broad outreach, which is fantastic. And I'm also excited about the diversity of the speakers in the symposium and who also come from across the globe. So just a couple of guidelines for the symposium. You've already heard from Dan how it's going to be um, organized. But please type your questions into the question and answer box. And if they're directed towards a particular speaker, please indicate their name. Indicate if you like a question, because that's going to help us to prioritize. We'll read some of these questions during um, the 30 minute, right after each speaker, and then also during the 30 minute discussion period. And the speakers, you can also respond directly into the question and answer box for any questions that are direct, directly specific, uh, directed specifically towards you. So feel free to do that. Um, a recording of the symposium is going to be available at uh, the, our website for global genomics and health equity, and I have shown that down below. And please tweet about this symposium. We want our voices to be heard about how important it is to have diversity, uh, both in terms of the subjects of human genetics research and in terms of the workforce as well. So I have listed uh, the Twitter uh, information down here. And now I am really pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Amboise Wonkum. Um, Dr. Wonkum is a professor of medical genetics in the Division of Human Genetics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, he is the director of GeneMap, which stands for Genetic Medicine of African Populations, and deputy dean research at the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Cape Town, South Africa. Um, after his MD training, which is, uh, was at the Faculty of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Yaoundé, he completed a thesis in cell biology in the Department of Morphology at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and a PhD in human genetics 
at the University of Cape Town. His, his research interests are reflected in more than 150 peer-reviewed publications, which are in molecular, clinical, educational, and ethical aspects of medical and human genetics. His research focuses on psychosocial burden and genomic modifiers of sickle cell disease, genetics of hearing loss, and ethical and educational issues in human genetics in Africa. Um, over the past five years, he has got lots of funding from NIH and the Wellcome Trust, leading consortia that have to do with things like the Sickle, Sickle Africa Data Coordinating Center, um, and among many others. He was awarded the 2003 Denver Pinard Prize for the best thesis from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Geneva, and he won the very competitive Clinical Genetic Society International Award for 2014 from the British Society of Genetic Medicine. He's also president of the African Society of Human Genetics and co-chair of the steering committee of H3 Africa Consortium, board member of the International Federation of Human Genetic Societies and committee member of the Global Genetic Medicine Collaborative. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Wankum and I'm gonna help. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thanks very much for your kind invitation. I'm very grateful to Professor Chiskov uh, to give us uh, the opportunity to share some of our uh, thoughts today. It will be my role to convince you that the next frontier of global uh, genomic medicine rests in the understanding of African genomic variation. For one, the reason is ancestral, the second being ecological, and the third being equity. And I will follow these three uh, paths uh, in my presentation. Uh, let's start with an African genomic ancestry and uh, complex threat and disease. There is a study that was reported about two years ago uh, that shows that a Pan-African genomes contain 10 times, 10 percent more uh, DNA than the current uh, human reference genome. A similar finding was recently reported using a whole genome sequencing of about 500 Africans from various and non-linguistic on the continent through the H3 Africa Consortium that shows that at least 3 million on single nucleotide variants are novel and are missing from the reference genome. Another important feature of the African genomics DNA uh, is that a good proportion of the African genomic DNA in ancestral African that derive from an archaic human population that existed before the split between a neodental and modern human is still present in a DNA of African population of modern Africans. When the technical challenges of isolated ancient DNA uh, from uh, all African uh, population will be uh, uh, overcome, it's highly likely that a better understanding of this variation may be associated uh, to threat and disease. In a similar way, a variant from a Neanderthal population have been associated to dermatological and neuro neuropsychiatric a threat amongst European and Asian, modern European and Asians. We know that there are some bias in uh, what we have now at data for genome-wide association for complex threat. Only about 2% of these genome-wide association studies that currently exist involve African population. Uh, this is a problem for translation in clinical practice in the sense that the polygenic risk score that aim to associate a complex uh, variant to specific threat or disease perform very poorly when it comes uh, to African population, which means that a variant that are relevant had not been captured by the study that are currently available. But we all know that we all have to gain while investigating African population, specifically using genome-wide association study. Low linkage decriminalism uh, will improve our fine mapping and uh, finally our capacity to identify causative variant. 
an illustration of that is that despite the fact that African population account only for 2% for all GYs that are currently available, they account for 7% of phenotype association. Top variants are very common in African population compared to other population and can be uh, important for diseases. For example, one variant that is very common is on these genes here called PCSK9 is associated with 40% reduction of cholesterol amongst African Americans. And this knowledge have allowed development of new medication for uh, cholesterol that is used for all the population worldwide. Some other variants are specific to African population. In this study from Charles Rotimi, they identify one variant in one gene associated to type 2 diabetes mellitus that is monomorphic in European and Asia, which means that even if you perform the same study in millions of European and Asian, you will not have found this variant unless you study African population. If we move from genome-wide association study for complex stress and use exome sequencing approach, a study in South African COSA for schizophrenia found rare deleterious variant in a, in a few genes. In a similar way, those genes and variants were found in population from European ancestry from Sweden. Third, with only 1,000 population amongst COSA compared to 5,000 in Swedish, there was more and larger effect size when studying Africans. I will now move from complex threat to monogenic disease. We also have evidence that the nature of mutation for monogenic disease in population of African ancestry is relatively different. For example, for Huntington disease, if you perform a diagnostic test in some population of European ancestry, one gene will explain nearly 100% of all cases. Why the very same gene HHG will explain only 70% of cases in African population and the rest explained by a different gene, the GPH3. Similarly, cystic fibro for cystic fibrosis, specific variant in CFTR, which is a gene associated with this condition, are very common amongst African population as compared to European population. And lastly, for hearing impairment, I will come back to this condition. One gene in the gene of Connexin 26 explains up to 50% of children that are born deaf in Europe, in population of European ancestry, but nearly 0% in most population of African ancestry that we have investigated. I will come back to this condition a little bit later. The second reason why we should study African population specifically is ecology. As you all know, the African continents span a north-south axis that is associated with variable level of climate, variable of uh, uh, in direct environment, and a variable uh, type of people. And this makes it extremely informative for genetic study. Compare, for example, of European or Asian, Asian continent that is span horizontally. But this variable level of climate is also motor of natural selection, some of which can be beneficial. And the typical example is the selection for the sickle cell disease mutation that protects against malaria. Selection of variant in April L1 for protection for trypanosomiasis. And uh, unfortunately, that also can lead to disease like sickle cell disease or susceptibility to kidney uh, disease like uh, association in variant APOL1. There are also some selections that have protects against uh, dengue uh, fever. And uh, what have not yet been properly investigated? For example, in this study that we published recently in Human Molecular Genetics, we map a data point of at least four genes that are subject to natural selection 
And as you can see here, there is a considerable overlap in with these four genes. One that is sickle cell disease, the second that is alpha thalassemia, the third that is GSGCSPG, and the fourth that is APOL1, which means that it's highly likely that many African will uh, co-enrich some of these variants. What are the interactions between these variants? This will still need to be properly investigated. What are the interactions between this variant and other variants subjected to natural selection that are still to be found? And the recent paper of H3 Africa identified 64 of uh, loci that was involved in that was naturally selected, and some of them were involved in immunity and response. Is it the answer to why some po most population in the middle of Africa are not suffering from COVID-19 the way in a similar way they suffer in Europe where there is more severe cases that will be subject to future investigation. The last reason why we should study African population variation of course is the imperative of equity. I hope that in the first part of uh, this talk I've convinced you that we all as global community we all have the scientific imperative interest of studying African population. But while we do that, we have to make sure that equitable access is part of our agenda. One reason for that is that African is represent 15% of the world population and technically only 5% of world gross domestic product. That means that African population may not necessarily have the means to explore the 300,000 of human genome history that they have in their DNA. It doesn't mean that Africa is poor. No, no, that's not true. Africa has just been stolen because that's the difference. There's a difference of being poor and being stolen because actually in Africa, we have a 30% of the world and mineral resources. But this capacity not to investigate because of low investment in terms of uh, in terms of research or translation are illustrated in this chart. Even for infectious disease, African investigators will tend to collaborate with Europe and America uh, with very, very few across the continent, like on the right hand side on the panel in, in, in uh, green uh, lines. Uh, that is actually motivated by us following money, by us following where grants for research are. Another issue is that for genetic studies that have been performed on the continent, uh, mostly by European investigator, American investigator, the focus might not necessarily be what is the priority of the continent. For example, in this study that was performed many years ago, 10 years ago, only 5% of study was on sickle cell disease. That is the priority number one for genetics in Africa. Another problem is the genetic education for health professionals and scientists as illustrated by the poor knowledge in this study that we performed nearly 15 years ago in Cameroon. The general public are not necessarily well knowledgeable of what genetics means. For example, in this uh, big family that we identify in Western Cameroon, where there was a lot of fragile X syndrome, and that is due to a mutation in one genes uh, on chromosome X, there was the legend that this was due to a curse that the chief of the village, the founder of the village, threw uh, to uh, his wives. And most, and lastly, even for the study that had been performed in Africa by uh, international investigator, the building capacity have not necessarily been at the forefront of the agenda. Um, and this has been illustrated by this study and some other people's study that shows that association measure by the authorship at the institution on the paper that had been published are not necessarily reflective of where the study were performed at least where the DNA came from. And lastly, the ethical and legal and social implication, at least the rule that should guide investigation and perform on genetic medicine of the African continent, I still need a lot of effort to be refined in the way that genetic study and genetic medicine can be equitably accessed by African population. But there have been a change, a massive change over the past 10 years 
by various initiatives and most importantly, the H3 Africa Consortium. Of course, these have allowed a fourth investigator, African investigator based in Africa like myself, uh, to start to write the genetic history of Africa, like the recent paper in Nature, allow us to focus on matters, genetic matter that account for the continent, like studying sickle cell disease. This is a bias a selection of some paper from my own research group. To build the next generation of workforce in genetics, this is a random example of a few fellows that have graduated from my lab, and some of them are already doing their own independent career in various parts of the world. And I will use three examples or three specific case scenarios to showcase how we can address equity while investigating African genomic variation. And the first case scenario, I call it the tragedy of the common, and the disease in point here is sickle cell disease. I'm very privileged to be part of a very a, a strong a professional pedigree of many investigators that have made their name through the study of hemoglobinopathy. I'm still working to try to know if I will have something left in the history. Sickle cell disease is a condition that become prevalent in Africa because of the selective pressure of malaria and the, uh, the resistance afforded by the variant. This is a condition that is associated to the distortion of red blood cell uh, because of the specific mutation that allow them to have the shape of banana and to block a, a vessel. And the consequence of that in multiple organ damage and short life expectancy. Sickle cell disease mutation was, disease was described about 100 years ago. The mutation was described a little bit later, about 50 years ago. But there's very few medication that have been validated and efficient for sickle cell disease. And consequently, the child mortality is still very high on the continent. But even in the context of America, adult mortality have not changed over the past 40 years. An adult with sickle cell disease will die for complication, mostly cardiovascular complication. And I would like to argue that genetics will have a role to play in care, prevention, and cure of sickle cell disease. The first level is primary prevention that can extend to diagnostic before birth. And this picture is the picture of the first baby born after prenatal genetic diagnosis that I introduced in Cameroon in 2007. I introduced the same in Cape Town about 10 years ago. But we know that when we perform this, we offer option for medical abortion, which means uh, some ethical challenges that we don't necessarily want to amplify. The second way genetics can help is to allow secondary prevention in sickle cell disease. The general architecture of all diseases looks like this. Monogenic diseases are still rare, they are simple, they are Mendelian. Complex diseases like diabetes mellitus, they are multigenic, there is a strong influence in the environment, and they are non-Mendelian. I'm arguing that sickle cell disease is the best on both concepts. This is a monogenic disease, it's very common in Africa, 2% uh, at birth in Nigeria, for example, is due to only single gene, but the influence of multiple genes may allow us to use genetic for secondary prevention. For example, we know that APOL1, we know that variant alpha thalassemia, we know that there is one gene called AMOX1 in combination influence kidney dysfunction in sickle cell disease. Very long time ago, there have been a development of a Bayesian model, a mathematical model that can predict the occurrence of stroke in sickle cell disease. And recently, using transcriptomic in the peripheral blood, it was possible to classify patients according to two clusters, and these clusters could even allow to predict possibility of mortality. So we can well imagine that more we know this variant, more we can be able to develop a panel that can be used for secondary prevention by identifying patients that would need aggressive treatment very early in life, actually at newborn screening. 
And lastly, genetic can help for a treatment of sickle cell disease. It was long time known that the strongest modifier of sickle cell disease is the level of fetal hemoglobin. More you is high, best the patient is. And fetal hemoglobin level is an inheritable trait that is conditioned by all the genomic variation, for example, variant in BCL11. And this had been replicated in various populations amongst African American, among Tanzanian, and in our own study amongst Cameroonian. BCL11A is a transcriptional repressor of fetal hemoglobin. In other words, you remove BCL11, you increase the level of fetal hemoglobin, and this has been used a very long time ago, more than 10 years ago, to cure sickle cell disease in mice model. And this knowledge has allowed us today the gene editing for sickle cell disease patient. I will probably be the target for major investigator, maybe using mRNA for treatment of sickle cell disease in future. We can also use new technology, the robust or the brutal force of a new generation sequencing to investigating the phenotypic variation sickle cell disease. In this study, we use whole exome sequencing to understand why is that even on the African continent, some patients with sickle cell disease, despite not having the best of care, will live up to their fifth decade. And we identified 49 genes that are associated in one hand with survival, in the other hand with severe disease like stroke. Our discovery cohort was in Cameroon, and we replicated these findings in population with sickle cell disease from Congo, and 12 of these genes replicated very well. Most importantly, a few of the genes that we found were already in the pathway of one medication that had been recently validated for treatment of sickle cell disease, that is L-glutamine. In other words, the nature in some of these patients have allowed them to produce endogenously this medication. Let's just imagine that each of these pathway engines that we found can be, of course, a root for new therapeutic manipulation because this is a natural experiment that have allowed some of these patients to select some variant to improve their survival. And, and if we targeted the variant and understand the way they works, we could just design easy treatment for sickle cell disease. We use in the very same study, uh, to the same whole exome sequencing approach to identify some of the genes that have very different level of expression uh, in terms of minor allele frequency as compared to the control population, and some of them are shown here. And uh, to confirm our data, we look at the publicly available transcriptomic data that replicated the very same pathway that we found using whole exome sequencing. Secondly, I will speak to the second uh, story of today to illustrate how we can address equity by studying African genomic variation, and uh, I will speak to rare disease, and the case in point here is a disorder of sex development. Many years ago, we started a genetic medicine clinic in Yaoundé in Cameroon, and we were surprised by the high number of uh, disorder of sex development that was present there, probably because of accumulation with time and no one to take care of them. And we set a program in collaboration with a few colleagues from France and Switzerland. And this program allowed us, for example, to have a precise map and nature of mutation for a common, for a rare condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, but also to provide some a solution, practical solution treatment for some patients with extremely rare disease, like this disorder of sex development. For example, in this boy, self-identifies as a boy, his karyotype was a 46XX, so a genetic composition of a female. He had a testis on one side and ovary on the other side. And uh, he was uh, identified from birth as a male. He was self-identified psychologically as a male. And uh, after a proper consultation and the necessary uh, clinical psychology consultation, uh, we provide an appropriate solution that was suitable for him. 
and that include hormonology, that include uh, removing uh, the breast that he had developing, that include removing on the other side an ovary, and to provide him uh, with the necessary hormone for, for his growth. This was a typical example where genetics is useful everywhere, whatever the, the, the context, whatever uh, the wealth of the country, whatever the wealth of the family of the individual. It was a typical case where even in the context of Africa for rare disease, the combination of genetic and surgery can help. It's like beauty and the beast living together. It's like beauty and the beast, the legendary beauty and the beast working together, genetic and surgery. Beauty is genetic, of course, you can imagine. And this knowledge have allowed us to send a very strong message about 10 years ago when we wrote this piece against the use of genetic for gender testing because we are not genetically literate enough to understand how it works. And according to the American Association of Genetic Counselors, this paper was used by the opponent of gender testing to oblige the International Federation to stop the use of uh, genetic in gender uh, testing. Uh, this uh, slide is an important slide to me um, because of my Nubian ancestry. And uh, this gentleman here is called a Sneb. A Sneb was a gentleman that lived more than 3,000 years ago uh, in Egypt. Sneb was affected by achondroplasia. As you can see here, Sneb have a beautiful wife uh, that was a normal size. And Sneb and her wife uh, and his wife, they have two beautiful children that are represented here. Despite the fact that Snape had a controversy, Snape was uh, a very important person. He was a priest. He was the chair of the war robe uh, of the pharaoh, and he was later deified. Actually, there was a celebration uh, for Snape after his birth, and he was actually uh, depicted uh, when uh, one of the pyramids was open. Um, I'm showing this story to show that a rare disease are stigmatizing the society. And it also an illustration that maybe 3,000 years ago, we as humanity, we were more tolerant for difference than we are today. And I will not comment more than that. The last story I would like to tell today, I will call it unknown in the exome database. And the case in point here is genetic of hearing impairment. Hearing impairment is called by epidemiologists, the silent epidemic, because it's quite common. A six, thousand, six children out of 1,000 are born deaf in Nigeria, uh, it's about the same number in South Africa, compared to two in Europe or one in, in China. Children that are born deaf, half of them are deaf because of a genetic mutation in their blood, and most of the time they were inherited in a recessive way one from the father, another one from the mother. Some children that are born deaf have something else that is visible. For example, in these uh, children, brother and sister from our cohort, they have striking blue eyes, and uh, the presence of striking blue eyes, deafness, and some changing on the skin define the Vardenberg syndrome. Some of them are deaf without anything, and we call it non-syndromic hearing impairment. In Europe and in Asia, 50% of children that have non-syndromic hearing impairment have a mutation in GGB2, the gene of connexin 26. We have performed the investigation in GGB2 in multiple African population, and uh, the detection rate was exactly zero. The only place where we found GGB2 to be prevalent was in Ghana due to one fonda mutation that is restricted to one specific village in the east of Ghana. Hearing impairment is due to multiple genes. At least 150 genes had been identified. The next thing that we did in our research was to look at the other genes involved in hearing impairment in population of African ancestry. And our detection rate was very low among Nigerian and South African. And the detection rate from other studies among African American was also extremely low, 26% when investigating 66 genes, compared to the higher end of 70% in American of Middle Eastern ancestry. 
we then select uh, very, very carefully family that actually Mendelize hearing impairment. And we selected a few family from Cameroon, run them through a panel sequencing of 116 genes. We was able, we were able to explain hearing impairment in 70% of this family. And more importantly, 60% of the variant that we found in those families that we resolved were novel variant. That's the first message. The second message is that in 30% of these families, there was possibility to identify novel genes. What we did, we took two of the families that was negative for panel sequencing and whole exome sequen sequenced them and found this novel variant in this novel of hearing impairment and that we confirmed using a modeling uh, to show that there was a problem with the protein. We used cell line to show that the disruption of that protein uh, or change the way the protein was distributed in the cell. Unfortunately for us, there was a mice model already for this gene, and that mice model deleted for this gene was a deaf. We designed a project that we call Hygiene Africa for Hearing Impairment Genetic Study. At the moment, this pro the study has been performed in seven different African countries. We are convinced that this study will allow us to move the next frontier of hearing impairment gene by identifying the genes that we know we will have to identify based on the study of the transcript form of the inner ear that indicate that numerous hundreds of genes of hearing impairment are still to be identified. And these are the very first analysis that we have performed, for example, for three countries. For example, our detection rate in Ghana is nearly a 90%. So in 10% of the family that we have studied in Ghana, there is a novel genes. Actually, we have identified exactly eight novel genes in Ghana, one for Vardenberg syndrome and uh, seven for non-syndromic hearing impairment. And uh, the paper now has been written. I will not say more than that because I want to keep the scoop alive. Uh, in Cameroon, we are also analyzing our detection rate uh, using whole exome sequence of family 60%. That means that the novel gene that we're going to find in those countries is even more higher. In South Africa, our detection rate is 70% using whole exome sequencing of family segregating here in payment. So these are real family, multiplex family. So that means that our detection rate in, in, in South Africa for novel genes will be also relatively high. I hope I will have the opportunity uh, to show you those data, which means that for this condition of hearing impairment, this population of African ancestry will represent a unique opportunity uh, to discover novel genes that will be important for all population in the world. Uh, this family will also help to push the boundary of our knowledge in population genetics. In this paper that we published recently, that actually met the cover of human molecular genetics, not only we discover the variant that explain hearing impairment in this family, we also found an unexpected findings uh, that shows that, that actually allele, ancestral allele versus derived allele, there was a differential frequency in population that have hearing impairment compared to normal control from the exact same country. Many, many uh, investigation can follow these uh, findings. The first is that it's possible that some congenital hearing impairment might be due to multigenic uh, con con uh, um, cause. The second is that it is possible that even for those cases where there is one single gene, there is an influence uh, in terms of a modifier of the variant in other genes of hearing impairment. The third, a hypothesis to be investigated in the future, it is possible that some hearing impairment a variant might be enriched and may be subject to selection in the population for the reason that we still need to investigate it properly. More importantly, the variant that we will generate from this exome for this monogenetic will allow to increase the representativity of African variation in database. And this slide clearly shows that in genome at the moment, there is only up to 10% uh, variant for population of African ancestry. And, and as we all know, as we have said, it's a population that has more variation. And this is harmful for everyone. Uh, for example, in this study that was reported five years ago, 
There was one specific variant responsible for cardiomyopathy patching that was labeled pathogenic in the European population. And that variant actually was very common amongst African Americans, up to 30%. And so it was clearly not pathogenic. And a simulation shows that even a small proportion of variation of African American or African, if this proportion was present in the database, this mistake will never have happened. So even for monogenic disease, not only we have opportunity to discover novel genes, we have opportunity uh, to refine our analysis for uh, variant deleteriousness. This is a historical picture for me. It was is me about 20 years younger um, uh, in the red circle, circle there. I was in Bar Harbor in 2003 for the short course. In the first line here is um, Victor Matrisic, what we call, who we call the founding father of uh, medical genetics, holding the panel. Uh, beside him is David Valley from, from Baltimore. At that uh, lecture specifically that year, is about uh, um, uh, 20 years ago, uh, Victor Makrisic projected this slide that I borrowed with him to him, uh, and he, where he showed that uh, by uh, 2020 uh, last year, gene-based drug will be available for diabetes, mellitus, high blood pressure, and cancer. That was his projection, and that but uh, genetics and genomic will remain inequitable in the world and will contribute to international tension. He was right, but what he probably would not have anticipated was that genomic variation for all population and specifically African population will be a scientific imperative. I hope to have shown you that if we do not have enough knowledge of the variation within ancestral African population, the foundation of the Human Genome Project that was depicted here by Francis Collin will be shaky because many more variants that will allow us not only to understand our history, to understand complex threat, to diagnose monogenic, genes, the monogenic diseases will be a completely missing. This is the message I have conveyed as an associate editor of the American Journal of Medical Genetics and to set with uh, Max and with Kata uh, the introduced case report in diverse population with the hope that we will have more variant, encourage more variant for population that are underrepresented to be present in the public literature. It is the same message I hope I will convey in my role of uh, Associate Editor of the American Journal of Human Genetics. It is the message I'm conveying in my next publication that actually will be published tomorrow morning, 11 February, because I'm recording this on the 10th, uh, that we need to sequence at least 3 million African genomes across Africa to capture the variation that will be useful for humankind but also to address equity in Africa. I hope this piece in nature will allow us to push that agenda forward and to convince funders that have been already very generous to my research to continue investing in African genomic variation so for us to meet the next frontier of global genomic medicine. It is the message and letting you go in home today with African genomic variation is the next frontier of human genetics medicine, global genomic medicine, and we should invest for it for the scientific imperative for doing the sound the way it should be done, but for equity to allow that the good of genomic medicine is available for all population in the world. Thank you very much. Dr. Wonkum, thank you for an outstanding talk. I wish we could have heard it live, but that's okay. All the best plans can go wrong, but it was amazing. And what we're going to do, we're going to skip the break so we have some time to address questions. And I would like to just ask you a broad one, which is, you know, you made a couple of really important points. One was the fact that the funding um, for research, genomics research in Africa, predominantly comes from NIH in the US and maybe also the Wellcome Trust and some other places in uh, the UK. And that the direction, the focus of the research isn't always what you might or people in Africa might think is most important. And one of the best examples of that is sickle cell disease. Um, 
And, you know, it's really tragic how underfunded it's been. Now, yesterday, one of our speakers, speakers was Dr. Gary Gibbons, who is the director of NHLBI. And he knows how important this is. And he's going to make it a top priority. But um, I guess my question is, and given your, I loved your ambitious goal of 3 million genome sequences, I want to know how are we going to do it? How are you going to do it? <laughs> And where, how are you going to get local contributions, for example? Will that happen for funding the research in Africa? And just before you answer, I also want to tie it into a discussion you and I have had in the past, which is now with sickle cell, there is gene therapy, right? It is possible to cure sickle cell right now in theory, but it's really expensive. And I remember we talked about that, and you said, I don't care how expensive it is, you know, we got to keep working on this until we can apply it. And I would just like you to talk a bit sort of broadly, how are we going to bring precision medicine to Africa? Yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thanks. I think, I think thanks again for the opportunity to share some of our thoughts and some of our uh, research with uh, this very important audience and uh, this really wide audience to hear what we want want to say. Uh, so I think the, the first uh, thing regarding funding, I don't feel bad at all to have funding from the NIH or the Wellcome Trust <laughs> because I know every single thing that I will find will not only help Africa but will also help the rest of the world. So I'll ask the NIH and the Wellcome Trust to give much more than that. And I believe by African participation uh, through the patient that we uh, recruit, it's already a big contribution. Of course, we would like to have more from African government and also from organizations within the continent, from charity within the continent. But at this stage, and because of the science and the imperative of doing what we are doing with African population, we need even more funding from international agents. So the the focus on um, on African-based uh, condition, on African disease, uh, once again, I, I would like to, to highlight one important thing here. The ecology of Africa that have shaped our genome as a humanity, as, as a human family, have not yet been scratched at all. We haven't even yet understand how it works. Yesterday, for example, uh, Neil, Dr. Hanshot, presented one variant in uh, PESO-1 genes uh, that is important for iron metabolism that seems to be associated with also uh, um, uh, malaria resistance. And uh, if we uh, consider that at least 60 novel variant or loci have been identified through the History Africa Consortium studies, plus the other variant that are subjected to natural selection, I, I do think in computer scientists and statistical geneticists have a lot of work to do to know what are the interaction between those things in individuals, just for half. So if we understand that, it will not only enlighten uh, genomic medicine population in Africa, but globally. The second opportunity, just through just that, studying a, a condition that have been selected in Africa for specific condition. Pleiotropism might be a, a, a great opportunity to explore. We know some population have moved from those environments, whether we are in Africa or out of Africa. For example, Bantu-speaking people in Southern Africa, uh, for example, South Africa and other population in Southern Africa, Kosa and Zulu, do not have sickle cell disease because they have been out of the malaria zone for more than 1,000 years. But we can take the opportunity to look at uh, 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 what, what we call eventually um, pleiotropism by investigating intra-African migration, uh, genes variation, and uh, freezing gradient to different environments and what, what is the effect on disease and health. And also pleiotropism for Africans that move out of Africa that are now living in America, African-American or in Europe, that are in a completely different environment for the past 500 years, and to see if that environment have modified gene expression in terms of disease and also in terms of uh, in in terms of uh, health. So of course, I, I just think that there is so many many mind to dig in African genomic variation that we are not even at the beginning of this of, of doing it. I completely agree with you. Now, 
it's it's interesting people you have for many years and i have for many years and my collaborators have for many years been pushing the fact that we need to be looking at uh increasing the number of people representation from africa in human genomics now interestingly a lot of uh companies pharmaceutical companies have jumped on board <laughs> and they agree they think it's really important so what are your thoughts then about commercialization should it happen? How can it happen? Can we do benefit sharing in some way? Is it a concern? Do you have any concerns about that? Yeah, I think there the, the are more and more um, agreement uh, not to speak to commercialization, but rather to translation. I, I, I do think there will be, uh, whether we like it or not, a need to collaborate with the private sector. Uh, if we want to move forward some of the findings into clinical uh, practice. We do know that the agenda of the private sector might not be the same like that of the public sector. Uh, public sector is generally public good, uh, equitably as much as possible. Private sector uh, usually will look for some level of profit, but there's nothing wrong with that, in that in principle. So I do think uh, this, those investments will have to happen to some extent. But of course, the conversation that is will happen will be at the level of equity. I, I'd wear, that way, maybe government, a relation between private sector and African government uh, to create an environment that could be market incentive for private sector to invest in disease of poorest people or people that have less resources will have to, to happen. Uh, uh, so that would be one of the ways to alleviate uh, the conflict that will eventually happen in terms of access. So how are things in terms of, um, you know, do most places have electronic health records at this point or where do things stand with that because that will be needed if you really want to do large-scale genome-wide association studies and precision medicine that would facilitate that yeah i agree with you i, I do think that one of the things that infrastructure within the continent will have to uh, to uh, to improve uh, we will need to have the capacity to capture environmental factor we will need to have the capacity to follow up a patient uh, speaking to sickle cell disease, I think our target funded by the NHLB actually for the from last five years was to establish a collaborative center in Cape Town that is now already have more than 10,000 patients in three different African countries. And we have set uh, some uh, basis in terms of infrastructure to follow up that country. We have been renewed recently for further five years and probably that opportunity to show that we can set those infrastructure that can allow cohort study for many, many years. Great, so we have a couple of questions here. So Gerald wants to know, what is the timeline for the 3 million African Genomes Project? <laughs> I wanna know that, <laughs> I yeah. also wanna know that. <laughs> so first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and humbled by the enthusiasm that that piece have generated. I'm very, very surprised by the contact that I have had nearly every part of the world actually, and to see that the paper had been uh, pushed forward in, in even in political uh, political uh, newspaper, I, I, for this one called by, for example, Le Monde, that is important for the French speaking uh, area of the world. Um, and first of all, that, that means that maybe, first of all, it's not my idea to say, I probably I just be the person that put the idea on paper and convey it. I'm, I'm sure many people uh, will have think the same way and maybe write the same way. So I'm happy that there is that level of enthusiasm. Uh, Three million African genome is the minimum. I, I do think so, uh, if, on, for many reasons. The first, if we look at the recent list of history Africa, there are minimum three million single type variant that, and that, was, that was novel. If we look at the pan-genome investigation that was done in 2019, there was at least 10% of uh, genomic content that was not present in the reference genome. And that means 300,000 potential variants that are not present in the reference genome. And if we look at the general uh, consideration between one genome and the next one, I'm different to you, Sarah, every 1,300 nucleotide, that 3 million. So we can imagine that the minimum to capture the variation that may be representative would be the magic number of 3 million. I do think 3 million is the bare minimum that we would need. What would be the timeline? I, oh, go, go. Yes, go Sarah? <laughs> no, go ahead. What's the I timeline? Think the, the, the timeline, we, we, we believe that we can do that in 10 years' time. I think with the technology that is available, we 
the cost of sequencing, we can target 300,000 the first year to some extent. We could not start from scratch because we know there are already some African genomes that are present in database. There are already some African samples. You have some in pen, for example. There are some in top med that can already be sequenced. There are 8,000 in UK Biobank. There are 50,000 in East Africa Biobank that we can use as a base at, at to start. Where do we have interest to fund it? Our target uh, in terms of core funding in $1,500 per individual that will include the sequencing cost and minimum phenotyping, which is relatively inexpensive for the size of such project. There is a precedent to set a biobank like the East Africa have done. So it's, it's not a dream that is very far away. Um, and, and I think we will have at the next East Africa some conversation around it. Uh, we have had contact already from various funders to know how they can help. We had contact from other organizations like the Thousand Cohort Consortium or, and Genome England that would be interested to know how they can support. Uh, so I, I do think it's something that probably was already there in the head of many people, but we probably have just been fortunate to convey the message. And that actually ties into the last question, which is Iman asked, um, how would you address the internal African diversity when you refer to the African genome? Or if you say you're going to sequence 3 million, I guess that includes then ethnically diverse, because he says, um, or Iman says, each country has multiple ethnic populations. I've also noticed Sub-Saharan Africa is addressed more than North Africa. Are you going to include North Africa? And how are you going to make sure it's equitable and that all diverse ethnic groups are included? First of all, we, we ha it has to be the whole Africa. So from the north, north to south, east to, to, to west. Uh, remember when we presented the slide on SNAP, uh, uh, the, uh, during the presentation we say uh, SNAP was Nubian, uh, like some Nubian are present in Central uh, Africa or in North Africa, in Egypt or in Sudan, for example. So we, it has to be the whole span of Africa because of the diversity of climate, because of the diversity of direct environment, because of the differential pressure of that environment have happened, because of the admixture that have happened within Africa for more than 300,000 years, because of movement across Africa in the Sahara corridor that need to be captured completely. In some country, it's highly likely that we will need more people, uh, according to a certain number of mathematics and available data, some from you, Sarah. For example, we know in Sudan, we will have to sample more people because of the high diversity within that country. In Cameroon, we will have to do uh, for exactly the same. So there will be a basis to know how do we share the lot in terms of numbers and in, in country, in, in environment, in ethno-linguistic, based on available data on the principal component that we know now and, and eventually to, uh, to cover the, the whole Africa. We have to cover the whole Africa if we want to have the truth. And remember, we still have those archaic, so-called archaic variants from very early humans that live the same way like uh, uh, as the sapiens sapiens in, in Africa for many, many years that we haven't yet even started to understand what it means uh, what is the real proportion, what is the impact for how, what is the impact for diseases. And the only way we can do that is to capture the whole span of Africa in terms of diversity of population, diversity of climate, and diversity of environment. That's a fantastic way to end the session. I just want to say that Rispa says, Asante Amboise. I say Asante Zana. <laughs> And be sure, to look, you know, be sure to look at the question and answers because there's a lot of praise going on and you can feel free to directly respond to people. So with that, I'm going to pass over the baton now to Dr. Uh, Stephen Joffe and um, please take it from here. Um, quick uh, word about uh, myself. I, I'm Steve Joffe, I'm a professor of medical Interim Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics Policy at Penn, also a Professor of Pediatrics. Uh, my research and interest, much of them is in the ethical legal of uh, genomics. So I'm particularly excited about uh, this afternoon's program. Uh, wonderful talk from Professor Wonkum, and really looking forward to the four talks we've got coming up. 
Uh, as a reminder about the format, uh, about 20 minutes for each talk and then about five minutes of questions. I'm not going to go through long introductions. All the bios are up on the website. Um, so without uh, wasting any more of your time, uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Kilda Fox, who's an assistant professor in anthropology at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Fox, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. I will. Good morning. All right, all right. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. And this is such an important topic. I've really enjoyed some of the, the talks that I've, that I've heard. And I think it's more important and timely than ever. Today, I'm going to talk to you briefly about missing sequences, why just increasing diversity in genome science isn't enough. And just starting it off, a little background about myself. I'm from Hawaii. I'm from the big island of Hawaii, specifically an area called Kohala. And it's a really beautiful place. It's extremely biodiverse. Um, we have some of the most bio, uh, diverse uh, soil profiles in the world. We have 10 out of 13 biomes on planet Earth. But it's also the extinction capital of the world and the invasive species capital of the world. And it's impossible to spend time in a place like Hawaii and not begin to ask questions about natural selection and diversity and the many ways in which geography has shaped our genomes and the interesting private genetic mutations that exist in certain populations of people. Um, in Hawaii, we have a saying, and this just means walking backwards into the future. I believe my brothers and sisters in Turtle Island talk about this in terms of thinking about seven generations in the future and seven generations in the past. So I think it's timely that when we really think about solutions that are related to the future of medicine, precision medicine, um, we have to really project into the future in meaningful ways and think about the way we interpret data that repatriates our deep past and, and identity in these really uh, special, important, and impactful ways as well. And we have to be careful because we know we've made a lot of mistakes in the past. We have to build on those moments. Um, I recently started at the University of California, San Diego. I'm going into my second year as an assistant professor. For me, it was really important to be near the ocean. We have a tremendous infrastructure for with the Scripps Institute for Oceanography. Um, many of you know that we have an excellent medical school. Illumina is related there. We have a thriving ecosystem that's related to genome science. Uh, but most importantly to me is that our university is perennially ranked number one by Surfer Magazine for the best surfing university in the world. Um, my research focus and kind of what my lab is focusing on, I'll talk about three things briefly today. One of them is safeguarding indigenous genomes and developing deterrent and counter technologies to ensure that, um, you know, historically marginalized communities uh, reap proportional benefits uh, from the genomes that are derived from our communities. Another is functionally investigating evolutionary just so stories with the emphasis on um, underrepresented groups. Um, really here I'm talking about utilizing base editing technology for a reverse genetics approach. And then three, I'll kind of finish with building more equitable systems for managing the health data of indigenous communities. Let's start here. Um, first, I should say that while I think it's really important to safeguard indigenous genomes and ancient genomes and ensure that, you're, that investigators aren't just seeking authorization, but seeking consensus building and true partnership, I should note that we also use the data. Um, and we are coming out with a publication that should be out in the next few months uh, predicting Neanderthal ABO blood types from genome sequence data, from next-gen data, and looking at integration and many of other things. So keep your eyes peeled for this paper. Uh, shameless promotion here. Um, second, we entered in a contest called MIT Solve, which kind of provides large, impactful projects for a range of things. We were in the indigenous communities portion of this contest. And this is a look at our team. We did really well. We won the community prize. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that project because it re relates directly to developing technologies to safeguard indigenous genomes. Um, like many little kids, I was inspired by uh, Indiana Jones until I learned about settler colonialism. This guy 
was actually modeled after Hiram Bingham III, who was a very famous Hawaiian resident, but he's well known for being a looter, grave robber, and tomb raider. Um, this explains why there's so many artifacts and indigenous remains in museums all over the world with very little kind of metadata uh, providing provenance for where a lot of these uh, ancestors came from and how they ended up in cold steel drawers and freezers in the first place. Um, and this anthropology of the past, you know, phrenology, measurement theory, all of these ideas, it's really not that different from the anthropology of the present and the way that there's a, a sort of bone rush going on and people um, actually getting access to ancient genomes without actually seeking consent in meaningful ways. And we can see that with the ubiquity of the ancient genome sequencing field that's going on today. Um, there was a really interesting and thought-provoking expose in the New York Times. Is ancient DNA research revealing new truths or is it falling into old traps? And I think it's a really good question because while this type of research has enabled us to really repatriate our deep past and understand human migratory um, uh, or diaspora in this new resolution and new way, it's also provided a whole bunch of an avenue for new ethical problems and violations of human rights. Um, we see that uh, in this paper we published in Nature, myself and John Hawks, where we determined that more ancient genomes had been sequenced in 2019 to 2020 than in the entirety of the history, uh, entirety of history. And that kind of indicates that there's this bone rush going on where we have an anxiety to publish. You can't just publish one ancient genome, you've got to publish multiple. And then that begs the question about consent and how a lot of these uh, ancestors' remains are acquired. Um, on top of that, making matters a little more complex is that the number of ancient genomics labs that have been constructed since 2010 have exploded. There's been this explosion in interest creating an ancient genomics workflow. Here you can see that in, in red. These are all the laboratories that have been constructed since 2010, work I published. Um, and to make matters even more complicated, Christie's, Sotheby's, eBay, Instagram, these are all thriving markets where indigenous remains are sold online and people can get access to all types of teeth and hair and bones that have indigenous DNA that can be extracted and can be sequenced and can be used um, to understand the deep history of many different communities without their consent especially in countries where there is no law like NAGPRA. Um, so inspired by that, we wanted to come up with a few technologies um, that really focus on provenance and connecting all types of metadata to actual samples in museum collections. So utilizing potentially CT scans and all types of measurements to actual remains so that they're not traded around from museum to museum like baseball cards. And this has been wildly successful, something as simple as a record keeping system, timestamps. We can really create new levels of accountability and transparency in a field where it was kind of lawless, right? Um, our second kind of technology that we're exploring and using, which is really interesting, is called computer vision. It's a form of machine learning. And what we do is we acquire images from a bank of images from Instagram per se, or video stills, and then we train a data set on those images and we analyze those images. We score them based on things like pixelation or um, asymmetry. And you can actually identify networks of people that are trading indigenous remains. And forgive me if you're squeamish and you don't like seeing human skulls, I completely understand. Um, uh, but, but these folks are trading and being involved in illicit trade of human remains online. So we can utilize new forms of AI technology to identify these illicit networks. And that's exactly what we've been doing. You can even go into the comments section and you can look into the way that these individuals are communicating with one another, brokering deals to the highest bidder. Um, all that is to say this is part of a much larger movement which in, within the decolonizing museum setting. Here are a whole bunch of beautiful Benin bronzes in the British Museum that are slated to be um, repatriated to Benin. So we just want to acknowledge that there are so many different avenues of development within this field, and we're just trying to create deterrent technologies so that this isn't a moment in history, but a movement.
Um, and in doing that, we started Regenerations, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii. This is a new exhibit that focuses on the history of eugenics and new technologies around that um, at our own Bishop Museum in Honolulu. If you get the chance to see this, you know, when the airways open up, I really encourage everyone to see it. We worked really hard. I don't think you'll find another exhibit like this anywhere else in the world. And that is to say, we have also and always been indigenous futurists. We had color newspaper in Hawaii well before the United States, electricity in Iolani Palace before the White House. And we have been thinking about utilizing the newest and most efficient technologies to empower our culture and our communities. So that brings us to our second part of this talk, which is functionally investigating evolutionary just so stories. Um, many of you are familiar with this idea that there is an overrepresentation of particular ethnicities of individual in genome sequencing and GWAS studies. Um, this is just sort of a, my own meta-analysis from 2005 to 2018, really focusing on how we are prioritizing European and Western European individuals in the pursuit of precision medicine. I think the whole point of this conference is to really focus on increasing diversity in meaningful ways, not just window dressing diversity, but ensuring that increasing diversity in genome sequencing actually has an impact in our community's health and well being and repatriating our identity and our past. Um, and one of the problems when you sequence only one population of people is that it allows scientists to develop what are called just so stories. And if you're not familiar with this, this is an idea that was uh, popularized by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton. Um, and this is kind of like this idea that when we take something that's correlative, when we have no causative data to support the claim that we're making, we root it in natural selection and these adaptionist narratives, they can be pretty pretty nasty. They can lead to a lot of false ideas about why and how population-specific mutations exist in certain populations of people. Um, Dara published this awesome review that I always give to my students, and I've read this thing like a hundred times, looking at global distribution of locally adaptive traits. And some of these are really A-plus stories, like ABO, why do we have blood type variation? We know nothing has been more impactful in shaping our, our genomes an infectious disease, and you can look no further to, you know, sickle cell anemia and many, many other examples that have been mentioned earlier today. We can slide over to the Himalayas and the Andes and think about high elevation adaption in genes like EGLN1 and EPAS1. Um, but for the rest of today's talk, I'm going to focus on this mutation in a gene called CREBRF, which was initially discovered in Samoa. It's a fascinating mutation. And what it looks like in multiple studies now is that it predisposes to type 2 diabetes, but, but sorry, predisposes to obesity, but protects against type 2 diabetes. And if you know anything about endocrinology, we expect to see a linear correlation between those things. We expect to see as one goes up, so does the other. We do not expect to see the correlation that uh, is being described with respect to this mutation. Um, so some of the just so claims about it are really interesting. I mean. Um, the variation in this gene is found in individuals who are quote unquote obese. And we are finding that thrifty mutations, they said it, not me, in CREBRF predisposed to obesity, yet protect against type 2 diabetes. Really important here because these investigators are invoking the thrifty gene theory, which we know is sort of an archaic narrative built around genetic mutations in specific populations of people. The just so claim, though, here is the evolutionary or natural selection reason why it exists. And the authors claim that the selective force that maintained this thrifty allele in Polynesia is related to scarcity of calories during the Austronesian diaspora. This is quite problematic for a number of reasons. And the media ran away with it. Uh, they said that the gene benefits sumo giants and how a powerful obesity gene helped Samoans conquer the, the South Pacific, initially first described there. But we can tell you as Hawaiians and oceanic people that we're the greatest voyaging community of all time and that there were no problems with scarcity of calories while we were identifying all of these island nations within the Pacific. In fact, our ancestors were using extremely complex systems of science, 
aggregating ecological metadata like bird migration patterns, using the stars at night, wind and current systems um, in the most elegant form of science that, that many of us know. And it is a disservice to say that we had problems with calories and other things, and that was the thing that shaped our genome during our diaspora, because we didn't have problems with those things. We were actually masters at horticulture. We brought all types of livestock along the journey. So you get the picture. It's not really a narrative that is empowering of our accomplishment and voyaging achievements as oceanic people. Um, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but we do have some problems with obesity. We have uh, many different nations um, in Oceania and the Pacific that have really high rates of type two uh, diabetes and obesity. So it makes building that argument quite easy um, and blaming it on our innateness um, as a variable rather than understanding what the consequences are of separating our communities from our land, our ways of health, and our fishing and hunting rights. Um, but when we look through this paper, at the actual um, sort of data, when we look at this Manhattan plot, we see this mutation kind of sticking out right here on chromosome 5. Um, we see the effect on body weight kind of has this uh, trend that, that the, the authors described, and then the effect of disease um, and the protective value against type 2 diabetes based on the odds ratio of these specific amino acid changes. So. Um, one thing that was also seen kind of later is that this mutation isn't just specific to Samoa. It's found and it's quite ubiquitous throughout uh, Polynesia, found in Maori populations, Tongan populations, Hawaiian populations, and most recently in Chamorro populations from the Marianas or Guam. And when we see something like this, like a population genetic mutation where there's a fair amount of narrative building around the mutation, but there's very little mechanistic or causative data um, that is really exciting to me, and that is an entry point for us to think about how we should properly characterize the effects of population-specific mutations. What should we be doing moving forward to move past correlative science and towards positive science using the best tools we have available? And so many of the tools that I've learned to use during my postdoc were base editing. And if you're not familiar with base editing, um, it's a wonderful new tool that allows us to essentially reverse engineer mutations. So playing the sort of same reverse genetics games that many people have played in the 1950s, uh, but with precision, using a catalytically inactive Cas9 with a DNA damaging catalyst, we can go in and create isogenic cell lines that include mutations that are very interesting to us uh, in the pursuit of functional genomic assays and screens. And that's exactly what we did. And here's uh, some sequencing data showing that we're able to introduce this mutation into HEK293 cell lines and create that amino acid change. And this is uh, forthcoming work. But the most interesting thing about this is we're able to create these cell lines for extremely cheap. If you go to some of these companies, they'll charge you between twenty to $25,000 for a knock-in, and we were able to generate this for less than $1,000. And it has portability for other sorts of scientific questions. Now we can really assess this question. Is CREBRF a thrifty gene? Can we test it for insulin sensitivity, inflammation, metabolomics, many different types of phenotypes and functional data that are associated with the, the diseases that um, we're talking about? And this can be easily adapted to gain insight into other candidate genes in obesity, type 2 diabetes, and many, many other systems. Um, my postdoc mentor, or, you know, back in the day, just published in brain organoid cell lines. And you can expect to see a lot more um, on the specific focus um, at UCSD and in the broader area. We are very interested in these ideas. Um, but, but now let's take a kind of darker turn here. So what do we do about monetizing this variation? Because non-Polynesian scientists that are not from our culture have filed a potential patent claim and they are attempting to commercialize the exclusive use of the physiological response to the CREBRF allele as broadly as possible. And now, if you're thinking, hey, what are you talking about? No one is supposed to be commoditizing a specific mutation. What about Mary Claire King 
uh, versus myriad genomics, and that's not supposed to be how it is. Um, but this is very much going on in, in different spaces, and there are these liminal spaces in which you can create IP and patent claims around certain things. Um, and so this is highly uh, unethical, in my opinion. And there are other uses of genomic information that are being embedded into surveillance systems in parts of China. So the reason I bring up these major ethical issues is because this is a future in a lot of different ways in a lot of different communities. And we need to really think about ways to problem solve this so we can avoid this dystopian future. Um, so questions I wanna ask all of our audience members and our panelists are, should all genomic data be open to the public? And if so, why? What does it mean when we only propose two ideas around access to data, either a closed scenario where something is completely privatized or an open scenario where it's um, everyone can, can make hay, so to speak, on data that a lot of it in which has been funded by publicly available databases and government money that really comes from tax paying dollars. Um, if you haven't read this book, it's pretty good. It's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism and it's by Shoshana Zuboff. And it describes how global tech companies such as Google, Facebook, and others have persuaded us to give up our privacy for the sake of convenience and how that personal information and data is gathered by these companies and used by others, uh, not only to predict our behavior, but also to influence and modify it. So in many ways, digital sequence information derived from our genomes is being embedded in and is a part of the big data economy that's undeniable. And when we know that data has surpassed oil in 2018 as the largest and most important commodity on planet Earth, we have to begin to have these more nuanced conversations about how DNA from historically uh, uh, marginalized communities is being commoditized. And that brings us to the indigenous data sovereignty movement. Um, if you're not familiar, you can read this review from myself and others. Uh, from Maui Hudson, Rights, Interests, and Expectations, Indigenous Perspectives on Unrestricted Access to Genomic Data, published in Nature Reviews Genetics. Um, this has been more and more in the news recently with COVID-19, strengthening the push for indigenous data control. As many of you know, this has been the largest en masse collection of biological information in history all at once, and it brings up a lot of really interesting ideas about how we safeguard that information and how we document that information and how that information is being used. Clearly, it's been very successful with the development of multiple vaccines. But on the other side of that, what happens to this information when we have relaxed uh, FDA exemptions around that data? Um, and many others are already stacking the deck for genetic discovery and developing and fast-tracking the development of pharmaceutical drugs. Here we have Regeneron focusing on this and thinking about this, working with multiple Amish communities and many other communities. And we have the um, success of pesky 9 inhibitors creating a new class of cholesterol drugs for data that was derived from African-American patients. Um, we also have the story of Vertex and how our broken healthcare system, lobbying system in this country has allowed the development of a $300,000 drug that was derived from sequence data from cystic fibrosis patients. In my honest opinion, I don't wanna live in a country where people can justify paying $300,000 a year for a drug to treat cystic fibrosis. I think we're better than this. I think we can do better than that and I think that Together, um, we can create synergies and unity and opportunities so that drugs become more accessible and we can have a thriving economic ecosystem that benefits more than just those that are creating the drugs in the first place. And that brings us to approaches to equitable benefit sharing. This is a paper I published in the New England Journal of Medicine, thinking about approaches, create infrastructures where we can create circular economic structures that benefit the indigenous communities that have graciously given their genomes uh, to large scale projects like the All of Us program in the first place. Currently, what happens in the open data environment, when that data um, 
hits the open open data market, it will be um, harmonized into much larger databases and used to fast track the development of pharmaceutical drugs. It's my opinion that community members just deserve to get a cut of that. So whether it's a collective interest or community trust model, or in the case of 23andMe, who is going public, uh, you might explore opportunities for giving each individual person shares and ownership uh, in the company itself to result in um, allowing you know, patients and participants to participate in equitable benefit sharing. Um, and I'm not the only person that's beating this drum. We have a lot of interest. I'm working very closely with the World Economic Forum and the, the Atlantic Council and many others in thinking about different ways that we can recognize data as a resource and create circular economic structures that could lead to cultural revitalization, better healthcare systems, better education systems, and decentralize and sort of enable our communities to get a much larger piece of the pie. So the future of indigenous genomics really includes enhancing ethical genomic research with indigenous communities. And I believe Professor Claus is going to talk to you about this uh, later today. Um, grassroots research, there's no substitute for that. I think in an ideal world, we use top down and bottom up approaches, democratizing technology and thinking about putting the technology in the, in the, the hands of the least, the looked over the last and the left out. Um, we also had the Singh Indigenous Genomics Conference. The first, oh, sorry. Just, Hello? Just uh, letting you know, uh, we're getting close to time, so I just want to give you maybe a one minute warning. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll have it wrapped up. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah, we have the Singh Indigenous Genomics Conference in 2020, the first Indigenous Genomics Conference with all Indigenous speakers. Um, we have this intense focus and renewed interest in algorithm fairness and all of the different ways that we are baking in bias into the algorithms that we create, including polygenic risk scores and others. I'm sure um, audience is familiar with that, um, including vulnerable populations and the assessment of data from vulnerable populations. I think this goes to say that any project is going to be better when you have diverse stakeholders sort of iterating through and making better projects. And then finally, something that was inspired by a master navigator, Nainoa Thompson, who said in a talk, we're remapping the Pacific Ocean, and many people are interested in remapping the human genome. Um, this means creating population-specific references using long-read technologies. Um, one of my favorite scientists, Evan Eichler, and his group did this with a Melanesian population-specific reference genome, and they discovered new human genes that have functions, which begs the question, how much variation is out there that we don't know about because we keep focusing on low pass genomes of much and much larger numbers of people rather than creating really good high quality genomes to serve the communities of people um, in the first place. And, and I think that obviously innovation in both directions is going to be important in the future and creating networks and opportunities for solidarity with, within Oceana and many of the ways that we are going to chart the future of precision genomics in the Pacific. And thank you very much. I appreciate it and I will take everyone's questions. Wonderful, thank you for a superb talk. Um, I think given where we are in the timeline, we may have to like reserve the questions for the panel discussion uh, at the end, we'll have a good 30 minutes to bring back some of the questions. There's a whole bunch of questions in there for you, but I want to make sure we stay on time. So great talk. Thank you. And uh, everybody, if you have questions, put them in the um, chat in the Q&A, and uh, we'll come back to them to, uh, towards the end. Um, next uh, speaker is uh, is Vince Bonham, who's Associate Investigator. Uh, um, he's going to talk about uh, moving beyond race. Uh, Vince, let me turn it over to you. Great. Well, um, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to, to be here today. Uh, and I'm just really pleased to be part of, of this group of speakers this afternoon, uh, of colleagues and collaborators and friends, and I'm just happy to be here. Uh, so let me just start with the framing of what I want to talk about today. I, I want to start uh, by framing uh, some of the work that's going on at the National Human Genome Research Institute with our new vision uh, for the future of, of human genomics. 
Uh, and a bold prediction that was made, can we move beyond race as a population descriptor in human genomics? So um, as you know, um, this symposium was set up with two themes and the theme for today's uh, session is the challenges with conducting genomic studies in minority populations. And I just wanna highlight um, several areas that will be part of my conversation around this question of challenges in conducting genomic studies in minority populations. First, the need for systematic inclusion of ancestrally diverse populations. Um, second, access and usability of genomics for all and an emphasis on all. And then structural racism. And this is particularly in the context of the United States. And then communicating genetic variation. And finally, I, I want to talk about increasing diversity in the genomic workforce. So I start this talk um, with the current environment that we're in with this pandemic within the United States and globally, and just thinking about the context of the clear disparities and in, equities that we are seeing within the pandemic. Uh, this slide is actually from last uh, spring, uh, showing the clear disparities that we have in Maryland, where I live, uh, and Montgomery County, and the challenges that we have that are been clear across our country uh, over the last nine months. Uh, and I, I, I use this slide both to recognize the uniqueness of the environment and the world that we're in today and the inequities that have become so transparent, but also as I talk about this question about moving beyond the use of race and genomics research, I am not saying that we do not use race in any way in collecting data to understand differences with regards to inequities uh, and the social context of individual lives. And this is clearly right now uh, an issue with regards to vaccinations and that the lack of, of equity with regards to who is receiving the vaccines today uh, and the disparities uh, within the United States in that context. Uh, and then thinking about this in a global context with regards to who is receiving the vaccines and who is not. So we must be able to measure and ascertain the differences that we're seeing with regards to populations, groups that are identified that are not receiving all of the benefits of the current treatments that we have for this pandemic. So I wanna focus on, for my, the first few minutes of my talk, on the National Human Genome Research Institute's strategic vision that was published in November, excuse me, October of 2020. Uh, this uh, vision was uh, published in Nature, and it really identifies what our institute sees as the future for being at the forefront of genomics. The vision is divided into these four areas, guiding principles and values, a robust foundation for genomics, um, breaking down barriers, and compelling genomics research projects. And these four areas make up the vision. And I wanna highlight two areas in my talk. So the first area I wanna talk about are the guiding principles and values for human genomics. One of the values that was identified, there are nine values that are identified in this vision. And one of the nine is this, strive for global diversity in all aspects of genomics research, committing to the systematic inclusion of ancestrally diverse and underrepresented individuals in major genomic studies. That's what this two days has all been about, is this issue of the importance, the scientific imperative, as well as thinking about it from an equity perspective, the need to make sure that we have diverse populations in the genetics and genomics research that is, that is being conducted within the US setting and the global setting. And without having that diversity, that we will not reach the benefits fully of genetics and genomics for the future of our country and the world. The second value that I wanna identify, and again, this kind of follows up nicely on the comments from Dr. Wonkum and from Dr. Fox, is to maximize the usability of genomics for all. 
members of the public, including the ability to have access to genomics in healthcare. And that requires engagement, inclusion, and understanding the needs of diverse and medically underserved groups are required to ensure that all members of society benefit equitably from the genomic advances with particular attention given to the equitable use of genomics in healthcare that avoids exasperating and strives towards reducing health disparities. And I wanted to spend a, a minute talking about this. Uh, and it's, it's a theme that we're seeing throughout this conversation over these two days. And that's the issue is, yes, we need more diverse populations. Yes, we need to have populations that have been identified as minority populations across the globe to participate in genetics and genomics research. But will they benefit? And how do we make sure they benefit? And how we make sure we are studying these questions as we also study and understand the variation that exists? So there is a recognition and there's a need, I think, as a field that we focus on this question about the usability of this new knowledge for all groups and all populations across the world. And that that too has to be an important part of our research and our policy development with regards to the integration of genetics and genomics in the clinical care. So I wanna take a minute, and this is the title of my talk, uh, and to talk about one of the 10 bold predictions for human genomics that's identified in the strategic vision. Uh, and these bold predictions were clearly meant to be audacious, to be provocative, to help the community think about the future of the field. And I think um, one of them is really essential for this conversation as we talk about uh, increasing diversity of populations in the field, of genomics and the issue of human genetic variation. So the bold prediction that I wanna identify and talk about is the one that states, research in human genomics will have moved beyond population descriptors based on historic social constructs such as race. Um, we have uh, at the National Human Genome Research Institute over the history of the Human Genome Project uh, and since 2003 have had a number of strategic plans. Um, this is the third strategic plan or strategic vision since the completion of the Human Genome Project. And this question in thinking about the social context of identity is incorporated into the conversation of this plan more than any in the history of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And this challenge with regards to thinking Moving beyond the use of race as a population descriptor, I think is an important conversation for the field of genomics, as well as social scientists and clinicians, as we come together to think about how do we talk about variation? How do we think about difference and its relationship to health and health outcomes? And what can we do to do this in a way that's both nuanced and appropriate for the groups that we uh, have participating in our studies? So I'm gonna uh, highlight a, a, a paper that uh, was published by a professor there at University of Pennsylvania, uh, Dr. Professor Wendy Roth, who has been doing a number of studies around issues of race from a sociological perspective. And she talks about the multiple dimensions of race. And so race as perceived, race that others believe you to be, elected race, race uh, you believe others assume you to be, and then your racial identify, race as you see yourself. So I'm gonna take the, the next section of my talk and really frame it in a United States um, frame. Uh, and it's, so it's definitely a US centric frame and I recognize that uh, as our conversation has been um, involving uh, scholars and scientists globally. Um, but there are some unique issues that I think that are important when we think about the use of race from a US context. So one of the things that's happened over the last six or seven months has been a real um, reckoning within medical education with regards to the appropriateness of the use of race. And questions and challenges have been made about the use of race in clinical algorithms, 
and clinical guidelines and how race is being used and if race is actually being used in a racist way. Uh, this work is, I think, important work. It's moving forward uh, medical education and the development and training of healthcare providers in the United States context. But it also raises challenges about how do we think about variation and population difference and make judgments to actually provide the best care possible for individual patients. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Cheryl Sellers, and I now about 10 years ago developed a measure and the measure is called the Racial Attributes in Clinical Evaluation, or the RACE measure. And this is a measure to assess explicit use of race in clinical care. And I, and I highlight Dr. Sellers' uh, picture it's at the bottom of this slide. Uh, she's been a collaborator of mine for um, more than 10 years. Uh, and in this measure, we assess uh, a number of different items of how healthcare providers, particularly physicians, but other types of healthcare providers, uh, nurse practitioners and nurse, use race in care. So I consider information from patients about their racial background. I consider my patient's race to better understand their genetic predispositions. I, I consider my patient's race when making decisions about which medications to prescribe. All of these from the perspective of seeking to provide um, use of race in clinical treatment and clinical decisions. And we wanted to understand that explicit use of race. So this is not implicit bias. This is not implicit use of race, but actual explicit use of race. How are healthcare providers using it to assess and treat their patients? And one of the areas with regards to the work that we did with the development of this race measure was to study and survey a group of general internists across the United States. So more than 780 physicians we examined and surveyed and asked a number of questions. And one of the sets of questions we asked was, what does race mean to you and what does ethnicity mean to you? And I highlight here uh, Dr. Ume, uh, Dr. Nakurika Ume, who was a post baccalaureate fellow in my research lab and is now uh, a resident at Stanford uh, in, um, in anesthesiology. Uh, and, uh, and just as I share and talk about issues of diversity in the workforce, we need to think about who we are training and how they take on the next step in their own careers in the work. So Dr. Ume and I explored this question about how these physicians uh, understood and defined race and how they understood and defined ethnicity. And if you see from this pie chart, uh, when we ask the question of race, more than 80% of the physicians identified race as a biological or genetic construct. And when we ask the question of ethnicity, more than 60% of the uh, physicians identified ethnicity as a cultural group. Uh, and I, I share this uh, slide uh, in a number of my talks because often in our research, we talk about race slash ethnicity in research articles. And this challenging of our need to be much more nuanced as we talk about populations and to describe what we mean when we use these concepts. So another question we asked the physicians was, does biological difference between racial groups affect health outcome differences? you see the vast majority of all the physicians agree with this statement and say yes, that biological differences do exist and have an impact on health outcomes. And then we ask, is race the best proxy clinicians have to identify the genetic effects on health? And you see a really a different distribution with regards to the responses here. Uh, and again, this recognition that it may not be the best proxy, but it is of utility to these physicians. So my other colleague, Dr. Brooke Cunningham, uh, who at that time was a, a fellow uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins working with Dr. Lisa Cooper, Lisa Cooper, and is now an assistant professor at University of Minnesota, did a sub-study looking at our race measure as well as a, a measure on clinical uncertainty and anxiety uh, due to clinical uncertainty that physicians have. And she found that the general internists with higher anxiety due to clinical uncertainty, not knowing what treatment decision is most appropriate for their patient, 
report using race in medical decision making at a higher levels than those with lower anxiety due to uncertainty. And so this raises this question of the use of race in a U.S. context as a heuristic in a way to provide clinical treatment. And is that appropriate or not? So I want to frame this now uh, back to our uh, conversation today about genomics and diverse populations and the challenges that we have of not having the ancestral diversity that we all would like within genomics research. And this gets to this question of how do we describe populations? So everyone has seen this, uh, this figure before from Mark Daly and his research group. I think actually it was shown a little earlier today. Um, that's talking about the diversity or the lack there of diversity in genome-wide association studies and its potential uh, adverse impact on polygenetic risk scores. And I just want to highlight um, the title that uh, the Daily Group provided uh, for this figure. It's Ancestry of GWAS Participants Over Time as Compared with the Global Population ancestry of GWAS participants. Well, this paper was picked up by a number of the media uh, and was discussed, including Vox. And this, using that same figure, this is how Vox presented it and the, the title for their article with regards to this specific figure. Racial Breakdown of Participants in Genome-Wide Association Studies. And the title of the article, Genetics Has Learned a Ton, Mostly About White People, That's a Problem. So I highlight here this descriptor of racial breakdown and descriptor of white people and thinking about why we as uh, researchers need to think about how our populations, how the media, how the public interprets the variation that we talk about in our studies, and how can we uh, move forward in a way that's anti-racist. So the field of genetics and genomics um, has been thinking about this conversation uh, as part of the racial reckoning that's happening in the United States. And many parts of the, the genetics and genomics community have raised the question, of how to be anti-racist, what are issues that are happening within our society that create this racializing of genetics uh, in a way that's inappropriate uh, from the perspective of communication, of variation, and understanding of the role of our genomes with regards to health and disease. And so this context is not just race. So my own research group um, has been really exploring this issue around ethnicity and the history of the use of ethnicity in human genetics research. And we did this by a study uh, looking at the American Journal of Human Genetics over a 70 year period of time with regards to the use of ethnicity. So my post baccalaureate fellow, uh, Julia Bion, uh, images there of, of Julia, and she's now a graduate student at Princeton in sociology, uh, explored this uh, in a way where we went back and we looked at all of the articles and did this uh, using various um, uh, computational uh, methods to analyze 3,763 articles with regards to the use of race and ethnicity. And if you look here uh, at this figure, you can see uh, the decrease in the use of race over time. And so uh, race is uh, in the blue. Uh, and if you look at the number of documents over time and, and the percent going down, as well as the number of documents. And you see ethnicity going up. And so this has been interesting to kind of think about these constructs and how these constructs are used and the overlap and the, the, the need to think about what people mean when they talk about ethnicity, what they mean when they talk about race, what do they mean when they talk about ancestry. We also explored this data from the perspective of who are the authors of the articles. And you see in, in the, the top where all the authors were from the United States. And you see that the, um, the period of time that race was used 
was longer than when all of the authors were not from uh, the United States, and that ethnicity was more likely to be used when the authors came from an, um, from Europe or from Africa or from other parts of the world, uh, and then the combination at the bottom. Uh, and it's just challenging us that these populations uh, descriptors that we use are often perceived as social terms and are explored and examined in that way. And so that we must think about how they change over time and how different populations of individuals globally use them and what they potentially mean to talk about and harmonize data across different databases. So I will close on this bold prediction by saying I argue that we must critically consider how race and ethnicity are used in genomics research uh, and medicine today. So I'm going to bring to close my talk, uh, and again, focus on this issue of the challenge, is talking about the need for increased diversity of the genomics workforce. Dr. Radner started this conversation today. Dr. Gibbons talked about this conversation yesterday. And I argue this is as important as the question about how do we increase the diversity of minority populations in research? Is how do we increase the diversity of who is in the workforce? So again, in our vision, we talk about this issue. I, and one of our principles that are identified is to champion a diverse genomic workforce, that this is an important area uh, that we have recognized as an institute. So, and we see this as a foundational area. We identified a number of foundation areas for the field of genomics, and this is one of them, is fostering a diverse genomic workforce. And I want to end with this. Uh, the National Human Genome Research Institute last month in January published an action agenda. And this is an action agenda that's a 10-year plan of what our institute seeks to do to increase diversity, starting early uh, with uh, programs at middle school and high school, but all the way through the ability for early career scientists to become independent investigators in both academic institutions and industry, uh, but the need to make sure that the field of genetics and genomics is diverse. I refer you to the action agenda, and I also refer you to a commentary that Eric Green and I um, wrote and was published in the American Journal of Human Genetics in January, uh, to really to articulate the importance that our institute sees that now is the time that we really need to be reflective of our own labs, uh, our own institutions, and our broader scientific community to make sure it's reflective of the diversity of the United States and globally. So with that, thank you, and happy to take questions if I have time. Th thanks so much for uh, another great talk, Dr. Bonham. I think since we are a few minutes behind on the um, schedule, I think we are going to um, give people a break now, and then we'll, we have the qu some questions that will come in for you but I'm going to save those up for the end, and there'll be sort of food for discussion amongst everybody. Um, so I hope that's okay. So thanks, thanks again for a superb talk. Um, we are now at 2:25 on my Eastern Time clock. Um, I think let's come back. Let's make it a five-minute break. We'll be about five minutes behind schedule. So I invite everybody to just take a stretch and um, come back in five minutes at uh, 30 minutes after the hour. Up uh, with the talk from Dr. Katrina Cloth. Great, welcome back. Uh, looking forward to our uh, next talk uh, from Dr. Katrina Claw, who's an assistant professor at the University of Colorado, Division of Biomedical Informatics and Personalized Medicine, who's going to be talking about ethics and best practices and research with indigenous communities. Uh, Dr. Claw, over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, yate, hello, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for the organize, to the organizers for inviting me to speak today, and thank you all for joining um, to hear uh, uh, these awesome speakers today. Um, so today I will be talking about research ethics in gen genomic research, um, specifically relating to indigenous populations. I'll speak on some work that I and my colleagues, including Dr. Fox, have done to develop an ethical framework for tribal engagement with the caveat that the framework can also be used in any community. 
And then lastly, I'll speak on um, how one can apply the ethical framework to real world genetic and genomic studies. Um, first off, I'd like to start out with just introducing myself. I am a tribal member of the Navajo Nation and grew up with this wonderful view in my backyard. Uh, this is Canyon Diche, a national monument. Um, on the Navajo Nation. Um, the Navajo people are one of the largest tribes in the United States, and we have a deep understanding of heredity and genetics. Um, genetics is not a new concept to many indigenous communities. Um, indigenous science or the ability to pass on information through oral history, knowledge, it's knowledge that is time tested, um, some tribes, you, like the Navajo, use complex clan systems to keep track of biological and non-biological relationships. Um, but we have used indigenous science not only to adapt um, specific breeds of sheep uh, for the Navajo or domesticate corn, as well as many other um, um, knowledge ways that we have developed. Yet it's also interesting that the Navajo Nation put a moratorium or ban on genetic research over 19 years ago in 2002. This ban was placed on genetic research out of concerns for unknown researchers coming in, taking their DNA and um, publishing on it without the Navajo Nation's oversight or input. And so since for 19 years now, no genetic research has really been conducted with the Navajo community. Um, so this is just something I wanted people to think about in terms of where I'm coming from. Um, but I am a new faculty member at the University of Colorado. Um, my research program uh, spans across uh, multiple disciplines. Um, the first I'll primarily talk about today, looking at LC of genomic research in indigenous communities. Um, but my uh, the other part of my work is looking at personalizing medicine in communities by looking at pharmacogenomic variation, and then also understanding the ways past human adaptation has impacted pharmacogenomic variation and treatment. Um, but with that, I did want to uh, commend our previous speakers for really placing research in context. So when we think about bioethics, um, uh, in the field of medicine and healthcare, it's the result of a history of research misconduct. Ethics itself is a philosophical discipline. It pertains to notions of good and bad, right or wrong, so really the moral life in community. So when we think of bioethics, it's the study of ethical, legal, and social issues that arise in biomedical research, so the moral life in the research community. Um, when we think, uh, so these are just some examples um, of past research misconduct that has really driven um, a lot of the human research protections we see today. Within indigenous communities, health research has also often been driven by a colonial epistemology. Um, take, for example, some of these research studies, which were peer-reviewed, conducted in the early 1900s. Um, from the titles, we can already see bias exists in who is conducting this research um, by referring to tribal people as primitive or a problem. One paper's central question was to determine what, um, whether the true Indian is dying out. So who determines what a true Indian is and who determines that? Um, so definitely not the indigenous people in this paper. So because of a lot of these wrongdoings, the Belmont was re report was established in which which the federal uh, pr policy for protection of human subjects is derived. So the Belmont Report, as I'm sure many of you are aware, has three basic principles. One, the respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. As, as a result of these principles, um, two of the most prominent requirements in human subjects research were to establish the formation of IRBs as well as the use of informed consents. And I know that um, some of this was touched on in other talks, um, but institutional review boards were established to provide oversight um, and approve and or disapprove of research activities in order to make sure that research subjects uh, participants were adequately protected. 
in addition, um, informed consent is a standard in many research studies in which you give information to the research participant um, as, well at, as well as ensuring that uh, participants comprehend and are voluntarily um, being involved in the research without undue influences. So when we consider the large biobanks used in genomic studies, there is a preference for broad consent and also the use of a single IRB. I think many of us have um, encountered this and from the researcher and funder side, this is very convenient for many reasons. But from the community side, this might not be in their interest. So as we can see from the many biobanks mentioned in the past two days of the conference, these biobanks are not diverse and they are primarily representative of European ancestry populations and lack representation from historically underrepresented communities. So how, when we think about the Belmont principles, how do we move toward equity and justice in research? So these are some of the questions that uh, my research program considers. So as more and more genomic studies are pursued, how can research be done in a respectful and culturally appropriate way with Native communities? And how can we as researchers, institutions, funders, engage communities in genomic research? And um, as health applications are developed, how do we assure that everyone benefits and not just um, uh, one population, and how can we also assure that disadvantaged populations are not harmed? So within the United States, there are over uh, 574 federally recognized tribes. Um, so this figure just shows the diversity of where the tribal um, lands are, um, are. Well, this used, well, all of the United States is tribal lands, but these are the uh, lands that um, uh, many tribes currently reside on. Um, but it's important to remember that over 70% of tribal members and their, their descendants live within urban areas or cities. Um, each of these 570 plus tribes is sovereign, meaning that a tribe is able to govern itself as well as regulate the research process on tribal lands and for its members. Native people are defined as citizens uh, of their tribe, as well as having a cultural affiliation. Um, so in 2016, my colleagues and I from the Singh Consortium had a multi-day meeting in which we considered these questions of research with indigenous communities. Specifically, a lot of us were really interested in how sh thinking about questions about how researcher researchers should foster stronger, stronger collaborations with communities and here are um, uh, some of the co-authors on our paper. So this was um, a paper from the Singh Consortium or the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics Consortium. And these are a few of the faculty members as well as past alumni, including Dr. Fox. Um, so we really do believe that un inclusion, including Indigenous peoples and other populations does have the potential to expand our understanding of genetic influences on health, but we want to think about ways of how we can do this in a respectful and culturally appropriate way. So with that, we came up with an ethical framework in which we wanted to build, bridge the gap between communities and researchers, as well as provide ethical guidelines for researchers in order to increase the inclusion of diverse populations. Um, we also wanted to make sure and ad to advocate for um, making sure that the benefits um, went to participating individuals and communities. So this is the primary figure in the paper. We used a circle to represent the six principles to show that they are cyclical and related. So going through the six principles should continually evolve as connections and research collaborations deepen. So one might want to revisit capacity building as more funding becomes available, maybe from a researcher getting a grant, or maybe new, new research questions arise and the researcher has to go through the research regulation process again. Um, so this is just meant to um, help individuals visualize what we um, envisioned. So one of the key principles um, is the, we, we like to start from the center of the circle. So understanding existing 
um, research rules and regulations. So looking at sovereignty and research regulations from tribes, uh, research review boards and elder councils, and then moving outward, um, looking at community engagement, how to collaborate with the community, not just as research partners, uh, not just as research subjects, but as partners from the beginning to the end of the research process. And then um, the third principle, cultural competency, listening and learning from the community to try to understand um, different ways of knowing. Um, the fourth principle, uh, transparency, just making sure research goals are known and working with the community to develop um, goals, hypothesis, and not overpromising the outcomes of research. And then the fifth uh, principle is capacity building, um, involving and training community members to assist with the study. And then lastly, dissemination. So working with communities to present research results um, as well as um, unique ways of distributing the findings. Um, so these are the broad principles, but I wanted to share how different research studies, um, different genetic research studies have um, incorporated these so for the first principle, sovereignty and research regulation, one way to do this is that the research study uh, acknowledges tribal sovereignty. So the NIH common rule upholds federally recognized tribes' sovereign ability to regulate research. So uh, the research conducted in their communities. So you, if you were working with a tribal community, you would be obligated to uphold sovereignty. And then making sure that uh, the study acknowledges that all data and samples belong to the tribes, um, going through the tribal IRB if, they, if there is one present, and then making sure that the tribe has oversight of published results and publications. Um, and as well as um, there has been a lot of talk about individual as well as tribal group consent, so group versus individual consent, making sure to have those conversations with uh, the groups that you're working with. And then also um, the integration of urban and rural tribal American Indians and Alaska Natives. So a lot of collaborations might occur in urban settings in which there is not a clear tribal group that you can work with. So there are many urban primary care centers um, and different approaches to using doing community-based research. Um, so one example um, that I can share is from uh, pharmacogenetic research being conducted with the NWA uh, PGRN network. Um, so this network is conducting research with tribal communities in Alaska and Montana. So here I'm just showing the community partner on in the box on the left side. So they have three community partners. And then for each of these community partners, there's a separate oversight and approval process. So for instance, with South Central Foundation, there is a uh, South Central Foundation Oversight Committee as well as an Alaska Area IRB in which um, the researchers from the NWA PGRN went through these uh, different oversight bodies. Um, and this is published in um, Woodall 2014. So in terms of community engagement, how do you engage a community and build long-term relationships? Um, what kinds of engagement plans uh, uh, can um, be included in a research proposal. So I think one really great example is looking at this partnership with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Um, so this paper goes through the process of how they created an advisory board for pharmacogenetic research. And this uh, advisory board has been in place for I think over 10 years now and continues to meet monthly. Um, but I like to, um, when I think about community engagement, I like to go back to Dr. Kim Talver's um, words. If you're going to work with indigenous communities, you have to be willing to make lifelong relationships. Um, in any endeavor with a tribal community, they, in, in order to build trust, I think that people need to think long term and not just the cycle of a grant. Uh, the third principle, cultural competency, um, so trying to integrate uh, cultural and traditional knowledge, um, making sure to just take the views of tribal members and think of this as bio bi-directional learning in which the researcher is learning from the community and the community is learning the researcher. 
Um, so one great example of this is from AV et al. This is also from Cell Central Foundation. Before embarking on a pharmacogenetic project, they actually did a qualitative study in which they interviewed patients, providers, and healthcare system leaders to uh, for their thoughts about pharmacogenetics in tobacco cessation treatment. Um, so in the end, their results supported that a lot of these stakeholders did want to do this type of research and they gave suggestions on how they could collaborate with existing tribal research programs as well as how to return results to the community. Uh, so for the fourth principle, transparency, um, we can just, um, we can, I've mentioned uh, consent and uh, sharing the research process in detail. I think for um, genetic studies, it's really important to talk about these last two points, the storage of data and the future use of data and samples. Um, so this is just an example of an, some language in an informed consent. Um, and it, does, it has to be very clear, your DNA and blood samples belong to you. Samples will be stored for the duration of the study at this location. So this is from a real, um, uh, a real consent form from a real study and um, tribal members felt comfortable with this very clear language. And then lastly, capacity for, well, principle five is capacity building. So really focusing on diversifying the workforce and um, one, uh, and also collaborative analysis as well as co-authorship. So one example of this is um, through the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics. Um, through this, the Northwest Alaska Pharmacogenomics Research Network has actually sponsored multiple students from their, the various tribal sites to attend the SING workshop and have actually helped host one of the SING conferences at the University of Washington. Um, so this is one way that not only can research studies promote um, diversifying the workforce, but also training the um, community members as well. And then lastly, distribution of findings and knowledge. So um, I think that we're all very interested in publishing research uh, projects in, journal, in high impact journals, but this not necessarily the community won't necessarily read these high impact journals. So making sure to publish not only um, in those journals, but also to distribute the knowledge in unique ways. So making pamphlets, newsletter. Um, this is one photo from us presenting to the community at one of the chapter meetings um, last, I think it was uh, last year. Um, and then also making sure we not only publish uh, or we make sure to have discussions about how we want the data published in aggregate data or um, and if they want their tribe to be identified. So these are just some real world examples in which um, many of you can use in your own research studies. I think that in conclusion, there are many opportunities to include underrepresented populations. I think that we need to shift the research paradigm from this um, top-down approach and really start working from the ground up. We can use ethics and CBPR, community-based research approaches, to increase diversity in genomic research. And it's important to realize that genomics is only one tool in the, a bigger picture, especially when you're working with tribal communities. Um, they're not only, they're not interested just in how genetics will help them, but how did they, what are other things in their community? Well, preventative medicine, um, I, ameliorate some of the um, disparities we're seeing um, as opposed to genetic research. So with that, I want to say thank you, Ahiaha, and to thank all of my collaborators and all of you for listening today. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thank you for that uh, talk, Dr. Kwan. We do have a few minutes for questions. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to put your questions in the Q&A box. And uh, while you're doing that, um, I wanted to, well, first of all, to say that the um, bigger in the model that you've developed through that SYNC Consortium Nature Communication Paper, I view that as one of the best models of its type that I've seen in the literature. So congratulations for that. And folks, if you haven't looked at that paper, it's really a superb paper that uh, you need to have in your in your files. Um, one of your, 
ladder slides uh, there, in talking about how to communicate the results or, or findings of a study, you, you said on the slide, no tribal identification. Just it, you said, ask the community or the tribe, you know, whether they want their tribal identification. I just wonder if you could say a bit more about how to think about the appropriateness of identifying if, if work was done in a particular tribe or tribes, the, the issue of identifying that tribe in scientific communications. Yeah, I think this is definitely a conversation to have with the group that you're working with. And some some tribes might not have an issue with it. Um, the One of the concerns is that since these are small, isolated populations, if you're publishing pedigrees, you might be able to determine who in the community um, is a part of the research study just because of um, how small they are. Um, so would have issues related to privacy, but um, but it definitely is um, at the or something that you people some tribes are able to, or are willing to have that published and others are not. Great. Um, a question that came in from Eric uh, Fahman, uh is there a role for returning individual results to study subjects or participants? Obviously, a question that could be asked in any context, but in the particular context of, uh, let's say, research in tribal nations. Yeah, that's. Um, I think it's not done often, um, but I, a lot of the work that I do in personalized medicine is looking at smoking cessation treatment, and we are trying to use genetic genetic results to return to the community, or at least to the clinicians when they prescribe um, a smoking cessation treatment for uh, individuals wanting that. Um, so I definitely think that there is there are opportunities. It would take a lot of collaboration with the existing health, um, health corporations or Indian Health Services um, clinicians. Great. Um, and maybe one more question, although it's it's a big one. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, I, I'm thinking about the question of control of a narrative or how a narrative is shaped is presented in the scientific literature. Thinking back to something I read many years ago about an ethnographer working in the Jewish community in Corso in the Caribbean, that community trying to take control of the results that the ethnographer presented from his own work. And I'm curious your thoughts about it, it, particularly in the context of community engaged research, research or true partnership, the question of uh, how the story is told and the input that the to the community or in, in the case of the tribe might have in, in actually sort of shaping the results as they're told, If a, particularly if a scientist views things a little bit differently, tensions between how the story is told. Yeah, I think that um, this is an interesting question, and it really goes back to how scientists view themselves um, as very unbiased. And in reality, we are all biased, in particular within Western science. We all come from a particular training and have biased viewpoint. Um, so, and a lot of the scientific literature to date has been published from that biased perspective. So when we think about community-based research approaches and involving the community in thinking about the research results and how they're presented, I think of this as just um, trying to be more equitable um, and providing a little more insight into um, the community's viewpoints. Um, I, from my perspective, it doesn't really create a bias. It actually enriches the data and provides a lot more context for what the results uh, people are seeing. Great. Th thank you so much for, for a great talk and for um, those thoughtful responses. And now um, for our final talk of the afternoon with the professor uh, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, Okay, uh, aloha kakakiaka. Um, I am uh, Marjorie Mao, and I um, have the pleasure of speaking with you today and want to thank the organizers, and in particular Glenn Galton, who I know from my Alaska Native work, um, for inviting me. Thank you so much. I wanted to say that I don't have any conflicts of interest. And just to give some context, since this is global, that 
Um, we are um, 11 hours and 20 minutes by flight from Philadelphia, and so it is uh, quite early. Let's see, it's 9.57 in the morning for us. And I love maps, and so this is a map uh, that is a Pacific Ocean-centric map. And <clears throat> I'm going to use uh, this context for talking about in community-engaged research. Um, and these are the bullet points that I'm hoping to cover in the time that I'm allotted. And um, many of you um, have, uh, I'm sure, thought about the Pacific Ocean since largest in the world, and we'll bring that to some of the discussion today. This is the Polynesian Triangle, and <clears throat> it is anchored by Hawaii um, and the Hawaiian Archipelago at the top, uh, Rapa Nui, uh, also known as Easter Island, and, Rapa, uh, and Aotearoa, uh, also known as New Zealand, uh, here just to give us some orientation. But this entire area, including Micronesia, Melanesia, and uh, the Polynesian Triangle is Oceania. Um, my faculty and staff have told me, because they've seen me give other talks, that um, Dr. Mao, you really need to put in a glossary of terms. So I did put in a few useful terms. I'm sure you will have them all memorized by the end of my talk. <clears throat> and I wanted to mention uh, Eolo Ma which is long lived the Hawaiian language since February is Hawaiian Language Month. So what do we mean by community-engaged research? This is a very nice paper from my American Indian colleagues, and I think it nicely summarizes um, the idea and also what Katrina mentioned about community as a unit of identity. We often think of individuals as the unit of analysis in our research. <clears throat> but in Native world, the community is also a form of identity. It balances research and action for the benefit of science and community, and, is, um, and it tackles relevant community-defined problems. Um, it's cyclical and iterative process to develop and maintain partnerships. It disseminates knowledge gained to and by all partners. It builds on strengths as opposed to uh, adversity or weaknesses and resources of the community. And as Katrina mentioned, um, it is a long-term commitment by all partners, and hence the word engaged. It's like a marriage. It's a commitment. Who we are, we're Naka Kanaka Oivi. And the word oivi, ivi, is our bones. So I heard from some of the other speakers about the interest in bones. We believe that that's where our, our mana, our power, our population sits. And in the traditional context, uh, kanaka oivi have many of these characteristics as how they would see research and how they see life in general. They're very place-based and they use place-based knowledge, such as Oceania. Relationships, incredibly important. We have a word for that. We have many words for that. One of them is pilina. It's generational. Another term that we understand is kanako ivi, which is piko e kolu, uh, which is past, present, and future generations. It's a holistic approach. We believe um, culturally that there's an in interconnection of all life forms, including the cosmos. Our language is Ola uh, It's Our cultural heritage is an expression of our values, customs, practice, and beliefs. And we have a component of critical reflection, which is not O-O, which is knowledge. But it's also, we may think of it in Western terms as critical thinking. We also, if you want to understand about Native Hawaiians, um, on top of what you heard from uh, Dr. Fox, um, is a historical, social, political context. So this is a graph of <clears throat> the population in Hawaii, and that uh, about 1700s Europeans arrived in Hawaii. A little bit later came Americans and the missionaries, and in about the 1800s, 
And in 1893, it was a pivotal year for Kanaka Oivi because the Hawaiian government that was recognized by many international uh, countries was overthrown. Um, and at that point, uh, Hawaiians, Kanaka Oivi, have actually been a minority in their own islands, in their own homeland. And immigration continues to today, and you can see the breakdown of the major uh, racial and ethnic groups here. So it is one of the few states, if not the only state in the United States that has no majority uh, racial ethnic group. What does this mean in today's context? Uh, for Kanaka Oivi, we now understand that although we are part of the United States, <clears throat> the state of Hawaii that is, our ancestral origins are Polynesian. We belong to the Oceania region of the world. And, not, and all Native Hawaiians today have an ancestor who came to Hawaii on a va'akaulua, a double-hulled canoe. The archipelago of Hawaii came out of the ocean. There was no land bridge from which you could walk over and then with the melting of the glaciers, the water filled in between them. You actually had to come on a canoe. That's the only way to get to Hawaii uh, uh, back then. Um, <clears throat> the first inhabitants of the Hawaiian archipelago came at about 1,200 years ago, and they came via Ba'akaulua intentionally and repeatedly. And they arrived with a system of indigenous ways of knowing. One uh, example that we use today is wayfinding, which is uh, non-instrumentation navigation. So today, uh, Kanaka Oivi, folks like myself, prior to the 1970s, most of us were pretty much unaware of our ancestral origins and had lived through this unspoken historical and cultural trauma of being minimized in our own homeland. And we were systematically marginalized, politically, culturally, and economically. We were banned from speaking our Olelo Hawaii language. We, our, our cultural practices such as hula were suppressed or modified by the, uh, the reigning government. And our places, our legendary famous places, Vahipana, were destroyed, cemented over. Um, this was institutional racism and it remains today. But interestingly enough, it actually coexists with this growing prominence of Native Hawaiian resilience, resourcefulness, and empowerment. So I have a poll. Um, how many have visited Hawaii? That's going to be part of the poll questions. And how many have visited Kapa Aina? So here's the poll. And uh, Dorothy, if you're able to release the poll, it'll take us just one minute, I hope. There's only three questions. And we'll be able to get the results in just a minute. Okay, uh, Dorothy, can you show the results? I'm really curious. I always ask this in, in an audience and I get a lot of hands. <clears throat> we have a lot of people still voting. 50 have oh. voted now, so we still have. Okay. Maybe you can come back to it when they are done. Okay. <laughs> It'll be a while. All righty. So there, this is a follow-up to these three poll questions. A few interesting facts you might have overlooked while visiting Hawaii. Who of the state's population percentage identifies Kanaka Oivi? Have you ever thought of that? Well, it turns out that it's about 20 to 24 percent of the population in Hawaii identify as Kanaka Oivi or Native Hawaiian. And where do most Kanaka Oivi live in Hawaii? Well, we have a fairly small land mass, as many of you know, um, but most Native Hawaiians actually live in rural areas on the neighbor islands, on the Big Island and Kauai, uh, and in designated areas of um, Native Hawaiian homestead lands. And what? What are Oahu Vanipana? 
or three examples of that that I wanted to mention, and I hope that this comes out in your poll, is Iolani Palace, as was shown by uh, Keolu. Um, it's an important piece. Um, Kukani Loco, which I, I probably should have given you a picture, but Kukani Loco is in the middle of a cane field, and it's a birthing place for royalty. It's a very important geographic location that's important to Kanaka Oivi. And finally, Mauna Ala. Mauna Ala is the resting place, the burial grounds of many of uh, our Hawaiian royalty. And it's the only sovereign piece of land in the state of Hawaii. I hope many of you have visited some or all of those places. And what is the socioeconomic status of Kanako Iwi population? Well, it turns out that actually Kanako Iwi struggle socioeconomically. In uh, Waianae, which has one of the largest concentrations of Native Hawaiians living in rural West Oahu, their poverty rate is as high as 30%. It is commensurate with many of my uh, American Indian colleagues when you go to reservations. So there is still quite a bit of the legacy of some of the uh, colonialism that has happened in Hawaii to Kanako Iwi. This led in 1985 to the Aola Mau report. It was the first comprehensive study of Native Hawaiian health needs and recommendations and led to the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act of 1988, three years later, that Congress passed and was signed by POTUS. And um, that happened to be a Republican president, uh, Ronald Reagan, signed the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act of 1988. And it was a bill to improve the health status of Native Hawaiians, and this had never uh, been prior. In 1991, the Native Hawaiian Health Research Project was funded by NIH, and it was the first epidemiological study of Native Hawaiian diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors one of the uh, highest mortality rates in the state from these two diseases. And it was, uh, uh, was, the purpose of it was to characterize the prevalence of diabetes and cardiovascular disease risk in a representative sample of Native Hawaiian adults. And it occurred in two Native Hawaiian communities on the island of Hawaii and on the island of Kauai. And it was the first to use standardized methodology. In 1993, I was fortunate to be, I believe, the first Native Hawaiian to be funded by an uh, R01 given by NIDDK to look at um, a lifestyle intervention administered with a social support person to improve lifestyle behaviors compared to standard intervention. And it was called, uh, it, the program itself was named by the community. It was called Kulia Olakino Maika'i, which is Strive for Good Health. And the research process included Native Hawaiian communities involved at the initial phase of the project. The community members from both of these two communities in West Kauai and North Kohala uh, were hired. They collected the data, they delivered the program, they completed the follow-up, and they were part of our published papers. This is one of the papers uh, that made the cover of Diabetes Care, which is um, for me at the time was a very big deal. Um, it was on the mediators of lifestyle behavior change in Native Hawaiians. And it includes my colleague, Dr. Karen Glantz, who I believe is at UPenn in the School of Medicine and Nursing when she lived in Hawaii. Uh, since that time, uh, for the, from 2002 to 2007, NIH funded repeatedly research on diabetes, heart failure, obesity, prediabetes, stroke, cardiovascular outcomes, and diabetes health services research. And all of these projects were culturally grounded and community driven. So we have been doing community engaged research before CBPR became a popular term. This is our website. And this is one of our uh, most recent R01 grants looking at the advanced care planning in Native Hawaiian elders. So we continue to um, partner with our communities and this is our diverse community organizations that serve Kanako Iwi Pacific Islanders, including Filipinos. Um, it's called the Ulu Network. It was formed in 2004. 
it uh, is all the community organizations in Hawaii and in Southern California now um, that are serving the holistic health needs of Native Hawaiians and Islanders. And it is, is, it is involved with the research division and the Department of the Native Hawaiian Health activities in many different ways. And it's actually 30 community members, uh, I think it's actually 35 now, and 70 plus sites in um, the Hawaiian Islands as well as Southern California. So from the beginning, our Ulu Network communities were asked, what is your opinion on research in your community? And how would you suggest research be integrated into health and healthcare? So I really appreciate Dr. Bonham's um, development of the race questionnaire. Uh, who would you trust to carry out the research in your community? And is research of interest at all to your uh, organization and why? And this is what they told us, heart disease cancer, diabetes, obesity, a huge problem, not a pun. And they wanted us, the Department of Native Hawaiian Health and many of, and of the few Native Hawaiian uh, faculty members, uh, they wanted us to be the gatekeeper for research. And when we asked about genomic research on Kanako EV with their communities, this is the answer we got. So we went about uh, realizing that this is where they were starting from because that's incredibly important when you do community engaged research is to start where people are. We started with a grant that was funded through uh, NIMHD called Pili Ohana. And Pili, as you remember from your glossary of terms, I mean relationships but it also stood for partnerships for improving lifestyle interventions. And these are the two websites uh, that we use. Basically, we use CBPR, CER, as the approach to conduct research. And in our case, it was an, uh, to look at um, obesity and diabetes prevention. Um, we uh, developed principles and guidelines for the overall governance of the steering committee, which included one academic partner and four community partners. So those of us who were in the academic side, we were definitely outnumbered. This is a, pic this is a slide of the people of the Pile Ohana project because the people do matter. Um, it was a multi-FOA um, multi type of grant where you write for each phase and compete for each phase of the CBPR grant, granting mechanism. In year one to three, this was our group. Um, this was, it was a planning grant. And 50% um, of the uh, team were Native Hawaiian. Um, we uh, then had Dr. Kahola Kula, who is here, um, take on the next phase and compete successfully, which was the intervention component. Um, and 50% of the investigators uh, and community partners were Native Hawaiian. And in the dissemination component, um, Dr. Kahola Kula was also the PI of, of the academic uh, component, and 75% of the um, <clears throat> steering team, research team, was Native Hawaiian. So I do believe that the, the prior speakers that talked about diversity in the workforce and being represented and at the table, uh, whether they're academic or community, was a key um, ingredient for the success of the Pili Ohana project. In terms of academic papers, uh, we created many, uh, this is just one slice that I could fit on one slide, of the many papers that talked about uh, taking evidence base coming from the Diabetes Prevention Program and ad adapting it into our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, um, how to translate that, the uh, the behavioral, biological, and social demographic variables related to weight loss. Um, just all of this, even in an assessment of the environmental factors of obesity. 
And it's important to, I want to give a call out to the community because when we ask them, what should we study? Uh, because we did ask them, you know, what's important to your community? They told us obesity. And so that's the topic that we actually studied. <laughs> in my opinion, uh, and in many, I believe the Piliohana project was an overwhelming success. Uh, it was Pilina, which means relationships, close relationships. There were professional achievements. We have multiple co-authored papers uh, with the community as part of the uh, co-authors. We've written multiple grant submissions and awards with community-based scientists. We've had this incredible co-learning of balancing the trade-offs of efficacy versus effectiveness because they are trade-offs. Um, the community has actually also achieved uh, uh, successes. We uh, collaboratively created a community health worker training program because for them, education invested in the community was critical. We have a 101 series. It's on our website, the center's website. Uh, co community leaders actually pursued further educational degrees. Some of them now have doctoral degrees. Um, we increased the capacity to function as researchers, the researched. Uh, and they created, uh, they gained employment experience, which was useful for other projects uh, within their communities. And I wanted to share a few tools for community-engaged research with Kanako Evian Pacific Islander people that we created to improve health disparities, and anyone can use them. First of all, uh, the principles and guidelines for overall governance. This is the website. The Community Health Worker Training 101 series. This is our ULU training. We have one on diabetes, heart, healthy weight, and kidney that we did in partnership with the National Kidney Foundation Hawaii Affiliate. And this is our publication on uh, the 101 series diabetes uh, training. And then we also created something called Community 101 for Researchers. It was uh, modeled after the old NIH Human Subjects online training that many of you are familiar with, where you go online and you uh, take this uh, uh, educational program and then take a few, answer a few questions and you get a certificate. Um, this is uh, what is the Community 101 for Researchers. And um, it is available uh, to anybody who wants to go on if you go on to that um, web page. If you go to our center, all these are uh, available uh, to you um, uh, for, for you to use. So you may be asking, since this is a genomics uh, symposium, will this community-engaged research approach work with genomics research? And in a Kanaka Uivi context, I'll have to say that if the past predicts the future, and these are some of the um, uh, stories that were done back in 2001, 2003, and 2003 to 2009 that involved genomic um, uh, research and data, which didn't turn out very well. Uh, the Catasil story, the Native Hawaiian Genome Project, one of our research scientists actually wanted to patent it. And the Kahlo uh, genetic modification uh, story in which uh, people wanted to uh, modify Kahlo or taro, which in Native Hawaiian context is the origin of the Native Hawaiian people. And so the Pao Kaleni Declaration was created to, in 2003, to stop or put a pause on all of this genetic uh, research that was happening at the time. But what if, what if the present uh, today can foretell the future? Um, this is uh, the study that uh, Keolu already mentioned about the thrifty variant in CREBRF. Um, and then most recently, uh, this paper um, uh, came out uh, just this month about the impact of global and local Polynesian genetic ancestry on complex traits in Native Hawaiians. And neither of these studies really engaged the individuals um, 
in the local community to understand what this meant. And I believe as ethical scientists, it is our obligation to communicate that um, and have a conversation with these um, diverse populations on what this means. So I would like to propose that imagine, imagine an indigenous scientific approach that combines the structure and function of what um, ourselves, our, our work and others have discovered that scientists of diverse background are a critical agreement, uh, ingredient, uh, community leadership, and specifically community le leadership that values science. It's not a question of science versus culture because our indigenous ancestors actually understood science in a very big way. So they embrace science. Um, open and transparent communications, and the training, very critical, of both scientists, researchers, and communities about each other's world. Um, it is part of our way of approaching communities that we start where they are and not where we would like them to be. Um, we create ground rules, we have guiding principles, and most importantly, you have to show up and follow through. It's what we call accountability. And every research activity begins at the community's level. What are their perceptions? What are their understanding of the benefits and risks? And what is the added value to their day-to-day -day lives? All important conversations that we have every time we embark on a new research activity. So we, if we could combine that structure and function with an ancestral knowledge approach, of inclusion and integration of traditional ecological knowledge and values. I have put up here seven, but I'm sure there's a much longer list. These keep, come, keep coming up and percolating to the top. And I mentioned them earlier in terms of our traditional context as Kanako Ivi, but I also believe many of my indigenous colleagues around the Pacific and perhaps around the world feel strongly about place-based knowledge. I know in Africa, which I truly enjoyed uh, Dr. Um, Ambrosi's talk this morning about place-based, uh, it is about relationships. It is about a generational look and a holistic approach, language, incredi incredibly important, not just for communication, but in the Hawaiian language, there's many kauna, there's secondary meanings of what we say. It's a very poetic language. And cultural heritage, let's not forget about our cultural heritage. And that critical reflection, that critical thinking of what this means is how a traditional people over the millennia have created their ancestral knowledge. So important piece. So I want to end by summarizing the promises and the pitfalls. So what we've learned um, is that community-engaged research is an effective approach to improve health inequities. The pitfall, however, is that the specific details and processes are key for it to actually work. Marginalized populations and communities must have safeguards in place prior to study data collection or publication of results. This is both feasible and empowers those marginalized groups. Diversity benefits scientific discovery and innovation. You've heard that over the last couple days. And achieving the benefits of diversity must include scientists of diverse backgrounds, not just diversity in the research subjects. And the policies recognizing and supporting equity in research are needed. Uh, transparency and disclosure of potential or hidden conflicts of interest are critically important, and that was brought out by Keolo's talk as well. And to me, the bottom line is the thrill of scientific discovery, because it is thrilling, should not be achieved on the agony of the defeated. And I wanted to, to, I added this slide about our uh, wayfinding um, experts. 
uh, and remind you of the Malama Honua. Um, and all the, this was uh, between 2014 and 2017. It took us three years to take our voyaging double hulled canoes. This is a Va'a Kaulua. Um, around the world, starting in Hawaii, through Polynesia, Aotearoa, Australia, through the Indian Ocean, to South Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean, to Cuba, along the East Coast, including uh, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, up to Canada, North America, and then back into Oceania. And it reminded us, um, and the purpose of Malama Honua, was to understand this idea that the ocean binds us all together. It's inescapable, and it's our kuleana. Kuleana, as you remember, means responsibility, but it also means privilege. It's our privilege to take care of mal malama, means care, honua is earth, mother earth, and each other. And with that, I'll stop and uh, take any questions and just to thank the organizations that have supported the work that I presented, our community-based um, researchers and our academic-based researchers that have been part of this. And of course, this is Hokulea, which is also on your uh, glossary of terms. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and perhaps stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Mao. Um, and yet another great talk for the afternoon. I think given the time, we're going to go directly into the panel. So invite everybody, um, Dr. Fox, Dr. Bonham, Dr. Claw, and Dr. Mao to put their videos on. Dr. Mao, I don't know if you realize we can't actually see you. It seems like your video may not be on. Um, oh, oh so yes. Invite everybody to um, to come on. And um, I, I have both from the audience and um, questions for um, all of you. So um, uh, give Dr. Fox a moment to come back on, and then we'll. Uh, We'll jump in. Great. Um, all right. And I, I think I have instructions from uh, Sarah Tishkoff. We'll, we'll go till four, so we'll have a 30-minute panel and then. Um, just a moment, Steve. I just wanted Sarah, to say yeah. if uh, I want to encourage Amboise Wonkum to join. Oh, good. I'd love to have him involved in the discussion. So Amboise, if you want to, please uh, turn on your video and your microphone so that you can join in. Can people see me? Oh, I can't see. I can see you all, but I can't. Yeah, we can no. see you now. It's a funky system, but we can see you fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering the same thing. I, I was like, I can see you. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to start out with the, the first question, which uh, I want to direct first to Dr. Fox, but then I want to open it up um, to anybody else who would like to comment. So, Dr. Fox, you're an anthropologist by training. Here you are. It seems like at least part of your work is in Japan. My, my question for you is why is it so important or, or why is it important that anthropologists and other social scientists be engaged in the sort of deep way that somebody like you is with a genomic science? Um, so I studied archaeology as an undergraduate, but I am a, I have a PhD in genome sciences. So um, I'm not just, I think like one thing that happens too is that when we focus on ethical research, uh, we sort of get pigeonholed because that's our kuleana, we say in Hawaii, that's our responsibility. But I have experience designing algorithms. I have experience working with patients. I have experience uh, working on hardware. Um, and, and Katrina and I actually went to the same graduate school. And it's one of the very best places in the world to technically understand the tools that we're using. So that is the, the pico or the, the gestating seed of the research that we do. From there, though, uh, we have been thinking about questions related to community building and, most importantly, power and understanding power dynamics in the ways that we develop these large-scale projects. But I think anthropology is an interesting discipline because there are just so many mistakes that have been made in the past. In fact, when I started this faculty position, I had someone tell me, you know, um, from our point of view, a Hawaiian person studying and working with the Hawaiian community, that's not objective, right? And that's like in 2020, someone told me this. And I think we need to dispel all of those types of conversations because when we work with our communities to design studies, it's always more impactful. 
if others have thoughts about the question of why it's so backgrounds in social sciences are, are working in collaboration with genomic scientists. Well, I would just say that, um, you know, the field of genomics requires uh, understanding the context of all of its impact on both society and on medicine, as well as our new knowledge uh, with regards to understanding the human genome. Uh, and that requires social scientists to be part of the process, um, both to help uh, frame the question and interpreting the findings. So it, it clearly is a field that requires different disciplines and perspectives to be part of, of the study to, to really move the, the field forward. Great. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Claw. Oh. I think from my perspective, I, like Dr. Fox said, I was trained in genome sciences and really focusing on evolutionary genetic questions. But when I started working with communities, my own community included, it um, really all of these other questions arose about, well, how do we engage properly and how do I engage, uh, make sure that we are doing this in a right way, in a respectful way. So really all of these arose when I actually started working with people and considering different perspectives. So now I work with multiple tribal groups and each one is very different and each one um, requires putting in a lot of time and effort. Um, so I think that um, thinking about these ethical issues did arise just from working with people and not really siloing myself in my lab just looking at data and so it really requires you to um, work with the community face-to-face -face. thank you um there's a question that uh, came up earlier uh from uh sarah nelson directed at dr bonham after or during or after but then you know others may want to weigh in as well um so from sarah nelson when genetic ancestry is parsed at the continental level it's often unfortunately map, mapped back onto social constructs of race, not just by the media, but by researchers as well. How do we avoid and counteract the slippage as a field? Yeah, no, I um, think that's a great question and an important question for the field. And I think there's a variety of issues that we need to tackle. Um, I would start with regards to journals, um, both from the perspective of journals and their policies on requiring authors to de define how they're using terms and to incorporate that into their studies, uh, but also reviewers. I mean, we're all reviewers on papers, and as we read and interpret um, um, individual papers, to, to really challenge to make sure the authors um, are being very uh, nuanced and careful and thoughtful in how they describe populations. So that's one. Um, I think the second is just more broadly uh, in our conversations and discourse within the community is to call out um, examples where people are slipping in how they describe and what they're using and just, you know, challenging in a positive way to help to move forward the field. And then I do think that we do need to create some consensus on some of these issues. I don't think we'll ever have one policy or one position or one directive on this is how to do it, but I do think it requires discourse within the field uh, to help to, to be much more careful and thoughtful in how we use uh, descriptors uh, in our work. Anybody else want to address that question? All right, another question that I had, which really caught my eye during uh, Dr. Wonkum's talks on you and Dr. Wonkum, but then uh, be interested in others' um, perspectives. You put up briefly on a slide uh, the little sort of screenshot of a paper that I think was titled Genetics of Schizophrenia, South African COSA. And I don't remember if that was your paper or that uh, if you were an author on that paper, if that was else's paper. But um, at any rate, it, it caught my eye. Here's a, a genetics, a potentially stigmatizing disease and the identification of an, a particular ethnic or tribal group. And I'm interested in how you think about the ethical issues that come with doing that sort of research in that sort of a context. And in this case, you know, as, as I had a brief discussion with Dr. Klopp, sort of putting a label on the group that that um, came from. And so I'd love your take on that as the person who put it up, but then hear from others. It really caught my eye. 
Yeah, it's, I think the first thing to say is that um, there was nothing uh, stigmatizing uh, in that paper uh, that study uh, schizophrenia in this particular group uh, from COSA ancestry, band to COSA ancestry. Uh, in, in, in so much so that our argument here was not the, the merely fact that they were COSA, the argument was that the very same study were performed in Swedish population the very fan rare variant in genes were found in Swedish population. Our argument was mostly that to have the very same result, you needed five times more sample in Swedish population than that particular African population. And the second uh, findings was that the findings within African population, the replication uh, uh, leads more um, more values in terms of statistics than in Swedish, despite the fact that the sample size was much more small. It was just an argument uh, to, to use uh, African population as a proxy for even for complex condition, even with a very small sample size, and not the mere fact that this population was Corsa. They could have been Irish or Chinese would have been the same. Or just just a precision is I'm not author on that paper <laughs> at all. Hi, uh, this is Marjorie. I I just wanted to um, make a comment. I'm looking through all the questions and I don't see this question coming up. So I just wanted to put out there because this relates to what Dr. Gibbons said yesterday. Uh, and Vince Bonham also mentioned, is this idea about diversity in the genomic workforce. And we're really fortunate to have someone like Keolu who's uh, in there and, um, and we have uh, trained epigeneticists and so on and they have trained in some of the best institutions in the world. Um, at the same time, I also see, um, having also trained somewhere else besides Hawaii, myself is that um, is there a mechanism for developing a diverse workforce where our young scientists don't actually have to be disconnected from their community? So what often happens in resource poor areas where they don't have all the ivory tower, you know, type of education that we would like our young scientists to have, you often have to move to be uh, involved, enrolled. And um, in, in our world, what I see, because we're so isolated from anywhere else, um, a lot of our young, bright scientists, uh, people go somewhere else and then they find the love of their life. Not that that's bad, um, <laughs> but they never make it back home, but they really want to. And so we see this constant drain. I, Katrina might be nodding right now because I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, is there a mechanism for being able to ta keep some sort of model where we can keep our, our investment in our young people tied to the communities they're hoping to serve? Maybe someone uh, Mark, can answer that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think Marjorie, I think that's a great question. And I think that's a really a great question for Dr. Wonkum because I think H3 Africa is in some ways a model that maybe the United States can learn a lot from with regards yeah. to maintaining uh, the development and training of scientists in their communities um, without having to, to leave to, to, to do that training. I would love to hear from uh, Dr. Wonkum on, on that because the science was awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very difficult balance, to be honest. Um, uh, I, I used to work in Geneva in Switzerland, where I say for a very long time, and, and taking a decision to go back on the continent was very difficult uh, in the sense that you, you are working in a place where uh, resources are not uh, at the least of the list of your problem, actually, 
in, in the lab where I was working, you had a lot of private foundation coming with funding and to say we, we would like someone to investigate this. You, you didn't really need to go to look for it. Working in area where resources are scarce, um, you have a very strong commitment. So I, I wouldn't say staying, at least in my case in Africa, is an easy thing to do all the time. And I will not uh, also hide that I have job of uh, many places all the time. Also. So it's a very difficult balance because you, you need a lot of commitment and, and believe in really what you want to do. That, that may be where the, the emotional relation between what you do, uh, your ethnicity and genetics is important. The reason why diversity in the workforce is important because there are some questions that can only be drive from inside with passion uh, by people from specific community. Um, not because they want answer for the community, that's true, but also because they want um, um, new direction in science. And sometimes the results are very surprising. So I'm, my, my short answer is that, yes, the, the, the diversity is part of the equation. You need to support people where they are to some extent. But we have to be realistic. We cannot keep everybody at the same place. I do think the concept of brain circulation has to come here. I, I would not imagine that all the young folks that are training in my lab have to stay, not at all. Actually, some are working now in Vince, they are NIH. But the most important is to keep the connection in such yeah. a way that a brain can circulate and allow the, the, the earth to be a global village. And that will make the science even more nicer. I, I appreciate that. I like the idea of a global village, um, and and um, I, I think that that's a great idea. I equally share. Um, it's a difficult decision <laughs> to come back home after you've been at uh, at uh, some of the best place educational institutions in the world. So. Yeah. Oh, could I add to that? Uh, it's someone here said, said uh, cost of living in Hawaii was an issue for me going home to do research. Um, we we have to live and work in the places that we want to with our communities. And a lot of these institutions need to make that financially viable for us. And if they don't do that, then it's hard for us to come home. So just putting a little pressure on these institutions. Uh, maybe prioritizing people that are from the communities, incentivizing those transitions and packages to bring home the best talent. I would love to pose a, there, there was a, a wonderful brief discussion in the chat that Dr. Claw answered, but I'd like to like have the discussion for everybody here um, and, and get others uh, input as well. So let me start with you, Dr. Claw, and then um, we'll open it up. So this was from Alana Pifram. Uh, how do you, as uh, people who come from underrepresented groups, reckon with being educated or working at institutions, important educational resources and opportunities, but also perpetuate imperialist and, really, and racist ideologies? So that was our question, and you answered that in the chat. I'd love for you to expand on your answer if you would, but then I'd love to hear others' thoughts as well. Yeah, sure. I think what I relayed in the message was that, yes, I do acknowledge that a lot of my training has been at these predominantly white institutions. It has been really great from the genomic side, but also until during my graduate school, I did feel like I was a little bit brainwashed on the genetic side and not really thinking about the community side. So. I did intentionally um, create a postdoc where I was working with communities and really thinking about the ethical issues. So, so I think that it, and it also, um, I did mention the Sing workshop. That really opened my eyes to, um, Sing workshop not only involves geneticists, um, but also bioethicists and social scientists. So I remember once sitting by a social scientist, listening to a genomics scientist speak about their research and the bioethicist uh, person was just aghast about what this person was saying. For me, I was like, oh, this is just a regular uh, talk that 
I would see at in my department and I was focused on the genetics, but they were focused on the way this person was describing the study. It was very racist. It was very biased. And I, it, I was clueless about it. And it's not until you actually get training in how to recognize those moments and create a um, vocabulary for it that you're, you just simply won't recognize it. So I think that with these workshops and additionally, um, a lot of institutions are um, requiring diversity training for and thinking about to put them outside of outside of their boxes and just recognize that there are different ways of thinking and knowing. Um, and more of my work, um, the more of the, my work I do with my community, the more invested I get in the looking at these different perspectives. And I think you just have to ground yourself in your community. Uh, I know I acknowledge that a lot of younger um, native individuals don't have that groundedness and if they grew up in cities or um, did not have those cultural strong cultural connections. So I think it's a it's something that we will have to keep dealing with as um, people keep uh, leaving their communities and going to these institutions but definitely. Um, and as for my position, I think of it as sort of working from the inside out where I can affect change at my institution. I can accept more, accept indigenous students who otherwise wouldn't have contacted a researcher at an institution. Um, I can give my opinion at admissions committees. So I really think of it as working, at working within for change um, overall. Anybody else want to address that question? Um, yeah, I can add. Uh, I think it's really interesting the way that we're trained and what becomes normalized and what sort of systems, like what are we optimizing for within education systems and what are we optimizing for in terms of forms of currency to promote uh, growth and how we define success. And I think that's really important. For me, my entry point into thinking about genomics. The first place I ever worked was with Charles Rotimi and uh, Ade, um, Ademo Deboale and many others. So, like, I didn't understand that the vast majority of people in genomics and Vance and Ed Ramos and many others at NIH, I didn't understand that by the time you get to a PhD or medical school program, every single investigator is white. Right. Uh, because my initial entry point was with all of these incredible uh, scholars from around the world and so that you know that that kind of changed my position and the way I thought about the systems drastically luckily though when we build cohorts of students in these programs I mean Katrina was one of my classmates she was like a year or two ahead of me but we could always check ideas and you know gradually as we kind of grew into these programs and prioritize different ideas and thought about the impacts and I think that's really important um, many of the people that are listening, as you design and pick the next cohort of students that come into your program, ensure that the diversity that you're seeking and the equity that you're seeking is real, and it's going to uh, promote the success of many of these students. And I think, and to piggyback on what uh, Professor Claw was saying, we now have the opportunity to influence those systems in a major way because we get to help design those cohorts and kind of determine what the culture is in all of our departments and as we review papers and grants and so on and so forth. So just wanted to add that. Can I, can I add maybe a, another perspective? Uh, in my younger age, when I started genetics, actually it was a random, it wasn't a call at all. If I say I was dreamed to be a geneticist, that was that absolutely not true. I, I actually wanted to be a regular doctor that see patient and, and happy to see patient. And uh, until uh, one of these days, I saw a a, a pamphlet uh, on on a panel, open doors in genetics, and I just went for curiosity to see what was it. And uh, when I realized that there was something called medical genetics, I said, "But that's exactly what I want to do." And then. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the youngest folk need to be audacious. What I did, I went and knocked to the door to the head of the department, that was Tiliano Santonorakis. I tell him I want to do genetics. 
And he said, uh, how, how do you, why do you want to say, because I think it's the thing I want to do because I think I can make a difference. Um, and he said, well, would you, where do you want to do your genetics? I would like to do it one day in Africa. He said, why, why do you think your genetics is important in Africa? He said, I told him, I don't know. But for me to know and for you to know, you need to train me to assess the need. And, um, and, and I, I saw his smile and, 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 and I had the, and had the place exactly that way. So there was no interview. There was no advertisement. I went straight to the person that took the decision and said, I want the decision. And I believe, uh, and I remember that was my younger age. I was 20 something years old. I was living in a place where only 1% of the population is black in Geneva. So people should not be deterred by the difference. If you want something, go for it. Whatever the environment, do not be impressed by, by the environment. I, I'd like to ask a question that uh, comes from Montserrat Morales um, that I think builds on what we've been talking about. Uh, just reading her question, I think there's a gap between medical and education and indigenous culture that limits knowledge translation. Could you discuss? How do we facilitate medical education that um, helps to sort of bridge the gap between indigenous cultures and um, and medical education or scientific education? Maybe Dr. Mao, you could start. Sure. So our um, dean of the medical school, maybe uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, uh, came from Yale um, and University of Oregon, and he. He was a, a, a true researcher and and white, <laughs> and but he had the audacious idea and could see the potential of the medical school in Hawaii, which is small, um, to really do world class research, and he decided to create structurally at the medical school. Uh, a clinical department dedicated to indigenous health. And um, at the time, I was, um, you know, busy with my NIH grants, and I try to avoid all meetings as possible. Um, <laughs> but I ended up uh, at this faculty meeting and listened to him about his vision of creating uh, the department that I eventually founded as the chair. But it wasn't just me. It was a whole team of people that helped to create this. And, and actually, it came out of the grassroots communities because he went immediately to the Native Hawaiian population uh, and said, do you think we should create a special place in our medical school to teach, research, and educate students on Native Hawaiian health? And there was a great debate at our medical school. No, it should be about Pacific Islanders. No, it should be about this. No, we don't really need to do it. We can do it in the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics and so on and so on. Forth. And we went through this um, debate, which um, revolved around whether it was worthy to have a dedicated place where indigenous health could find a place and a home. And um, we basically uh, decided and voted on it, and it became a reality. And then it was the hard work of actually piecing it together, getting the Board of Regents to approve it, getting funding for it, writing the grants for it, putting the faculty in it. And it's still a work in progress, I must say. But I know that in uh, Indian country, there are tribal um, uh, colleges, and there's um, um, you know, now medical schools that are trying to be created for uh, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native health. Um, and I, I think it's great because you, you do have to bring those, those pieces because it's so multidisciplinary um, into the fold of where indigenous people think about their world, which is very holistic. <laughs> Um, and uh, you have to feel safe enough to talk about a topic which uh, conventionally is put in about 10 or 12 different spots. So I am so proud that our dean actually decided to do that. I'm proud of the role that I played in creating that department, but it does take some audacity 
and it does take some courage and then it takes a bunch of money and resources so i um i um i'm still part of the department but i i i've stepped down as an administrative chair person and uh, i still do what i love most which is doing research so that's my thoughts on how to uh, integrate um, indigenous uh, health into mainstream um, accredited medical schools. That's great. Just looking at the clock, wondering if anybody would like to just have a last word, either re responding to this question or something you've been burning to say, we haven't given you the opportunity um, before we turn it over to Sarah and draw. Oh, I just want to say it's uh, what you guys have created and this whole opportunity for dialogue is amazing. Also to piggyback on what uh, Dr. Ma was saying, it's so important for younger researchers to see people uh, like Arkalka, like Dr. Mao uh, succeed and do all of these unprecedented things because it makes it possible for us. And so I expect the next generation of scientists to be moving at a totally different pace coming out of indigenous communities and historically marginalized communities. And so, you know, the future's looking really bright. Right, and I just well, want to it's say been a fantastic series of uh, talks this afternoon and uh, great panel discussion. So just want to really say thank you to everybody. And uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Great, so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. Just a few concluding remarks, if I can get that to work. And there we go. Okay. So first of all, I want to just give my sincere thanks <laughs> to all the speakers um, today, also the ones yesterday. I mean, you guys have truly moved me. <laughs> like this was just an amazing discussion. And I know you had a really big impact on the audience just by the nature of the questions that we got. Um, I just want to uh, remind everybody that we're going to have a recording of this available at our um, Center for Global Genomics and Health Equity website. Um, I thought I'd just summarize a few key points. These are just a few. There were so many amazing points made, but some things that came through loud and clear. There's an urgent need to include ethnically diverse populations in human genomics research. One important way to ensure that this happens is to increase diversity in the human genomics workforce. This is going to be central. We need to better understand the genetic risk factors influencing both rare and common disease in diverse populations and determine more equitable ways to conduct human genomics research and to share benefits with the people who are subjects of the research. So I, I like this phrase. I think this was Dr. Claw who said, develop an ethical framework for tribal research. So we need to respect the rights of indigenous peoples to determine use of their genetic information and enhance training so that they may be full partners and ideally leaders of genomic diversity studies in the future. We need to stop using race as a biological classifier, use more appropriate classifiers, ancestry, ethnicity. It, it often depends on what the question is. But do continue to use race when studying the impact of systemic racism on health inequalities. And then I just have to end um, with uh, this quote from uh, Dr. Bonham, where he said, create an anti-racist field of science. I think this is a great thing for us to try to achieve. Again, I also wanna thank all the participants who came from across the globe I'm really glad that you were able to join us. And most importantly, I really want to thank the people behind the scenes who helped make this happen. Dorothy Hammond, Assistant Director of our Center, Amina Alamin, Executive Assistant, Augie Benjamin, the Research Assistant at Penn, and Kim Runyon, Communications and Seminar Coordinator in the Department of Genetics. Uh, down here, you can see our website address. Please check it, and we should have this posted very soon. And Thanks again to all of you for joining us and to all of the speakers. Take care. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Yep, thanks. Take care. Aloha. Malama.